<laughs> now we're live. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, pets of all ages. Welcome back to episode, what are we, five? Five. Of the Automotive Podcast. Five whole episodes now. The podcast where you don't have to build model cars, but it sure does help. <laughs> <laughs> Just to uh, rip off one of my uh, favorite football guys. I'm not a guy's a Green Bay Packers podcast. I'm not a Green Bay fan. Don't live in Wisconsin, obviously, but his thing is welcome to you know the podcast where you don't have to be a Packers fan, but it sure does help. <laughs> I was like that <laughs> intro. <laughs> so... Yeah, so what's been going on? You're other than your uh, world famous traveler. Yeah, I've been traveling a lot. Um, went to Columbus last weekend, uh, two weekends ago, just not this past weekend, but the weekend before, and then last, like yesterday, was Detroit. So, good shows. It's it's nice to be back going to shows and talking to people and looking at model cars again. I am officially jealous. As, uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, I, I try to move myself away, so I'm not so much into this picture, and I just blurred the whole background of my camera out. That's nice. Oh, well, yeah. you, you guys know what's back there. You've been watching that same back shelf for seven years now. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been to uh, Buckeye a number of, time, number of times, so familiar with that show. I have not made yeah. it to the Detroit show. You so, haven't? Uh, I'm surprised. No. It's um, huge swap meet. Huge. Like, like maybe one one and a half rooms of N and L East, big. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's, good size it, comparison. Yeah. There's uh, but there's toys too. So there's you know like Hot Wheels and die casts and baby dolls and you know stuff. But a lot of good, good, uh, good old kits. Which I I was kind of surprised at. I was looking for you know the Tamiya kits and stuff, and just uh, didn't find any. <laughs> but there was a lot of old AMT and Johan and stuff like that. Oh, so of, I, I, I skim through your video, uh, yeah. both of them, because you know after, as, as after a while, it's the same stuff everywhere. I appreciate it for the folks who don't get to go to these shows because it's got to be you know like holy sh look at all this stuff I could buy. <laughs> You go to enough shows after a while, you start. It's the same vendors, you know, at a lot of these places. I saw Becker was out at both. He was in Columbus and he was right in the entrance there when he came into Detroit. Right. So that's like, oh, that's my local hobby shop. I don't care if he's there or not. <laughs> but for uh, people that are not familiar with him, that's a huge swath of cash he'll take off you right when you walk in the door there. That's for sure. He, he carries all the new stuff and. You know, some, you know, maybe a year old or two years old stuff, too. So, well, how's, the, how's that venue good... in, De in Detroit? Like I said, I've never been there. So, how, like, you know, lighting good, like room, is it is it a decent place yeah. to, to, to be? Because I I haven't been to the Buckeye since they moved it into the McCoy Center. So okay. I've not been in, I've not been in that venue either. So it used to be, I've been to the one, you, you were, well, you were gone for that while. Because it used to be in a building at, at the county fairgrounds. Okay, so no, literally, literally, you know, in a rabbit barn <laughs> where they, you know, <laughs> during the county fair, that's where the, the bunnies apparently are shown. So <laughs> I've not been in the new uh, professional uh, looking. Yeah, it's there. it's really nice. It's almost like a banquet hall. I would I would almost say like a banquet hall. Because, you know, when you're looking at at models uh, that the lighting comes into play a lot because, you know, you get these places yeah. where they're in the, the VFW hall or they're in the. You know the, the 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 basement of the local Baptist church or whatever, and it's like, hey, we're it's so dark in here. <laughs> Someone passed me a flashlight. I want to go take a look at the contest tables. Yeah, that's the problem that we had at our um, iClub club show in Akron. We we were at the Goodyear um, Goodyear factory, and uh, the lights had a yellow tinge to them, which kind of threw everybody off. You know, when you're kind of looking trying to look at model cars, and everything looks kind of yellowish, but. Uh, but the Detroit one is 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 like a gymnasium, mm -hmm. so you know, really good lighting and lots of space. You know, we weren't like tripping over each other. Kind of nice. Okay, well, I'm gonna still be here, but I gotta do something about this camera because it's driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's just say, uh, what'd you take with you? Like, not to help that camera at all. <laughs> so, like, uh, in terms of 
Oh, no, man, it's really blurry. Ah, yeah. here we go. Okay, sorry, guys. Technical difficulties on my so we'll check with I, you. I took the two Miku cars that I finished the 2018 and 2022. Okay. Um, the Alpha Alpha Ferrari, the SF Spider, SF90 Spider. Um, since it was a competition, I took some a uh, 71 Roadrunner. I don't think you can see it up there, but um, that one's got like wires and stuff. I was like, hey, you know, these guys like wires, so I'm gonna take a wired car. And um, what else did I take? Oh, the No Love Challenger over over here. Um, that's my 2009 Challenger that I hopped up with speed equipment that nobody ever pays any attention to. But I love it. So it's uh, so mine. I, I can't think of whose pictures I saw from Detroit, but I, I knew you were there because it's, it must have been towards the end of the show. Your Challenger, the Ferrari, and the other car were all on the end of a table. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was packing up. I was like, oh, somebody caught him right before he was walking out the door, right when he walked in the door, one of the two. Yeah. I was packing up. Yeah, it's uh, funny. A bunch of people were snapping pictures, <laughs> and they were all together. I was gonna say, I because you you bumped into uh, I don't know if you bumped into him personally, but a gentleman named Ron Ford, who's a uh, I'd say primarily a race car builder. He's the one that had the in Columbus at least. I don't know if he went to Detroit or not, but he had the uh, the BMW uh, prototype car. The one that has no, it's like the oh, real swoop, the yeah. IMSA car, right? It's oh, on a big, yeah. it's on a, on a big background, a plaque background. And they the gray one or the white one? Um, both of them. The other one's a Peugeot. So he okay. bought both of those. And then he yeah. also had that uh, Miller High Life, like IMSA Mustang that was box stock. I know that that was there. So I know you bumped into him because I saw he, he took pictures of the Miku cars. Okay. So. He was, he's another person along with uh, Mr. Weber that has uh, one of those T-shirts that Lau has put out with the GT3 cars on it for this decal oh. sheets. Oh, was, I didn't know he, he made was, a shirt of that. Yeah, so he was out, He was in Pittsburgh and he had that shirt on. And I was sitting there going, I know where you got that shirt. I was just talking to him the other day about what <laughs> he has them sized in like some local sizing. And we're trying to figure out like the the oh. more robust or the more robust amongst us what size it is we need to order. <laughs> Because uh, you know, by like, I was like looking at measurements. So I said, like, "Look at Nita, one size bigger." And he's like, "No, no, I'm a large, and this is a two X." And I was like, "Oh, okay. I think I might be off the size chart then. <laughs> this is this is unfortunate." So let's see here, Dean Lewis, welcome, Carl. Let's see, Kandeski. I'm gonna go with that name. Altuna. So you're right up the street from me, about two hours away. And then Jeff Gravel from Ottawa, Canada. Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us. But yeah, so yeah, I, I've teased him about that. It says, how long are these shirts going to be in production for? He's like, I just wanted to make some for myself. <laughs> and so I decided, well, like I've already made them. So why don't I offer them for sale? So I'm like, okay, well, I mean, that works. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I'm going to grab one eventually if I can figure out, like I said, what the hell size that I need to actually wear. But let's see if I can bring this up. Actually, I think I have the picture of in my stack here. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. So this is what he's talking about, right? Yeah, it is. It is something like that. It is a slightly different shirt at this point. Here, okay. Let me share. Let me share that. I can't make it any bigger. Oh, neat. The nature of the thing, but yeah, it's got the logo up here, and then it's got what is this? Eight of the GT3 cars. Oh, that's a neat shirt. Yeah, and then he's also made up one for. We just get a little close up there, showing. Oh. The, yeah, how nerdy are you? <laughs> but he's also he's also made this no smoking, no problem one for all the the uh, tobacco decals he's made, where he had to blank off of the uh, the tobacco liveries on the back of the instruction sheets, cause, you know, verboten. So right. I like that too. I'll probably grab one of those. I, I, we were having a, you know, we were having a conversation about this this you know GT3 decal sheet because this car, in particular, this Audi, was a. Um, let me get off of this. So we're back to. What we're doing is a three three team car, and each one uh, is a different part of that American flag. So as you if you set them side by side over the top of them, it makes the American flag. And we're like, John, uh... Mister Brolin, you need to go get an Audi. And then he already he already has like an Audi for that sheet. And then I was like, we need to fit, get these together and build one. But then like, where are we ever going to be at the same time and all that? But it's a good time. 
I'm looking forward to grabbing one of those shirts. Like I said, I, I just I just gave him two hundred dollars today for decals and resin. <laughs> puff, so. I was like, yeah. Guy asked him, I said, what's coming next? I didn't get an answer. I'm like, so we need funds? Is that what you're saying? Here, have some money. Yeah, yeah. He loves you. You keep the lights well, on at his house, I yeah, think. Yeah, him and, him and Frankie both. I, I'm, I'm keeping their, their, their electricity fully funded. <laughs> so I, I have to say, give him a shout out. My son, Tears from the UK. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I saw that. Well, I glanced son. at it and did not make the connection with the last name. There you yeah, go. so he's in the UK right now, um, working, and I'm uh, babysitting his car. So uh, it was 62. I almost took your car out today, son. He uh, he left is behind. It, is it not one o'clock in the morning there? Right, <laughs> go to bed. Yeah, I think they're plus five. Yeah, right. yeah, go to bed. <laughs> anyways, um, he left behind a 2009 SRT Challenger that. The 6.1 liter Hemi at 425 horse just wasn't enough. This company in Texas yanked that out and put a 700 horsepower all aluminum Hemi in it. And it's it's a beast. <laughs> it's a beast. Are, are you allowed to have that much uh, horsepower underneath your control? I mean... No, no, it far exceeds my IQ. So <laughs> I, I, I just for, I just foresee, you know, scrolling through my uh, Facebook feed and seeing like, you know, Fox Eight or uh, Cleveland Three, the picture of you surrounded by the men <laughs> cop man takes his son's car off for test drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just going around the block. It has to be loud. It has to be. Loud. Oh, it is. It is. Challengers, challengers are allowed to begin with. So yeah, making it. You take. You need to take most of the exhaust off of it. Yeah. Ooh, Carl's brother in Virginia has a 70 Superbird. Rock on. That's a that's a high dollar car. You almost don't want to take it out. Yeah, you know, I had a conversation with somebody a, a while ago. And we're gonna discuss this in a little bit in a you know sub thread of what we would do with the billion dollars because of the lottery. Yeah. But we had this conversation a while back about the lottery, and there was a place I used to pass in North Carolina all the time. That it was either a Superbird or a Daytona. I couldn't tell from the road going by. It's just a winged Mopar. Right. And I said, if you know, if I had the money, I'd buy that car and drive it home. And the, and the, the guy I was talking to was like, you wouldn't drive that thing home. That's worth too much money. I'm like, they built that car to be driven, not to sit in some museum on the side of the road. Right. Like, right. I have a, I have hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm self-insured. I'm driving the car. You know. <laughs> yeah, there's a dealership here in Cleveland called Marshall Goldman, and they have you know. Ferraris and McLarens and you know Lamborghinis and it's all inside of a showroom. You're not allowed to. You're not even really allowed to go inside or take pictures or anything. They don't. They just don't want you in there because right. they're you know billions of dollars worth of cars in there. But one day I did go there and um, just said I want to walk around. I build models. I you know I love these cars. And they're like, okay, just don't touch anything. Don't take any pictures. Okay. No problem. So there's a there's a collection. I sent you that link a few, couple three days ago of that. Uh, it's called the Dare to Dream collection that's being auctioned off by I think it's Sotheby's oh, up in yeah. Toronto. And like that is that is like we're talking about. There's only like three or four things in that that, that don't exist in model kit form. That would be the uh, quite a collection to build because a lot of Ferraris that exist either through Hasegawa, Fujimi, or Tamiya. And then there's a bunch of just the Porsches that could be all enthusiast series to me, kits and to me, and right. I get all right, this series for Jimmy, right. yeah, to me, it gets the 911 GT1 and all that stuff. It was just a like, what's the what's the backstory behind that? I know that's an investment, like, I don't know that you'll never know the backstory behind it, but like, somebody spent a lot of time and a lot of money collecting a lot of very, very high end machinery, and now it's like, ah, guess that's I've fun. had my fun with time to sell it and make you know, make my money back because. I was looking through it, and then the uh, he had a 288 GTO, and reading, reading through the description of it because you know those Sotheby auctions, you have to take the grab the pictures when you can because they tend to, you know, they're they don't uh, backlog the photos to go back and look at. So if you save the web page, a lot of times they'll be gone when you go back to look at them. But you know, I have a 288 GTO. I have that enthusiast series Fuji. I have one too, <laughs> and that car in that collection is red, and I have the molded in red version. Oh. I think it is. 
And I'm like, okay, you know, let's take a look at the pictures. Just, 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 just look at it. Cause you know, obviously I'm not going to grab it and build it right this instant, but it was like, you know, the beginning of the big five Ferraris. And so I went and looked. And so apparently within the Ferrari collecting world, there are the big five Ferraris and this guy has them all. It's the 288, the F40, the F50, uh, mm-hmm. Enzo, and then the La Ferrari. And this guy has a red, you know, a red one of all five of those cars in that collection. And I was like, Again, if I had a billion dollars, like you got to buy all five, right? Got to keep them together. Like they're like <laughs> yeah, a litter of kittens, right? You don't want to separate them. So, so that, yeah. collecting collecting something like that's the doorway into getting cars out of Ferrari because Ferrari's always been real picky about you have to own this to buy this, you have I've, to own that to get one of those kind of things. I've heard that 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 they wouldn't sell you an FXX unless you've you know been a race car enthusiast or whatever yeah, you had to have the whatever they end the yeah you couldn't have an xfxk without an fxx you couldn't have an fxx without having like a, a ferrari challenge or a 599 gto x or whatever the you know previous race cars were and i know right. for a long time if you were coming into buying ferraris if you wanted to get on the list to buy the higher end stuff you had to buy the the it was what people were called the bread wagon you had to buy the state you know the little two-door station wagon the gt4 loose oh okay. if they couldn't sell those things because nobody was really <laughs> like yeah you know what i wanted was a ferrari shooting brake and right uh, so they were like that was a commitment purchase if you want to be on the list to buy a 599 gto or you want to be on the list to buy you know like an 812 super fast or something like that you have to buy <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy the two-door wagon or or uh you know you're not a serious enough collector well that's one way <laughs> to get rid of cars i guess right right so um james and i earlier today were talking about the the big billion dollar lottery that's going on right now and you know i was saying that i don't know that i would build models as enthusiastically anymore if i had a billion dollars i don't know that i would have the time or the interest to do it anymore. What what do you think, James? Would you would you still collect? I think that if I had the a, a disposable amount of income, because like one point one billion dollars is so much money you can't wrap your mind around it, even right. paid out over twenty six years, it's hundred it's tens of millions of dollars a year. And I run, you know, the on the background, the that National Police Car Archives website. Mm-hmm. And I think I would probably put a lot of my efforts into actually staffing that in a way that it was a functional website rather than it being a one man show who's too busy to do anything with, which would probably be my you know my job going forward. But my my debate with the with the uh, lottery was always that I would buy, in this case, the company that gets sold every ten minutes anymore, Ravel, because am I the guy that run a model company? Probably not, but I like to think that I am. And <laughs> as I was discussing with you, I think Mobius is too small. I mean, okay. they're owned by Pegasus. I don't really want to own all of Pegasus. I don't want to move to California. And there's, you know, their their niches, you know, very every version of a 66 to 71 Ford pickup truck, right? Right. Round two, I love what those guys do in a lot of cases. You know, say if I swing this way, clearly, whoops, what, round two kits right here. So yep. buy round two kits. But I don't know that I necessarily want to tow around that nostalgia train that they're doing. So much of it is involved, invested into the past. And Tom Lowe has a hundred has millions of dollars himself. So hey, I already got one company owned by a rich guy. You don't need to have <laughs> an even richer guy buy him out. I don't think that an American could go into Macau and buy out a, a Chinese owned company. So I don't think buying BMAX or Nunu is technically a possibility. And a lot of what I want to do at this point in time in my modeling career would be the race car stuff. And so I said Ravel because Ravel had offered in the past, obviously, the Ford GT, the the, the modern Ford GT Le Mans car. And then they did the C5, C6, and C7 Corvettes. So doing a C8 GTR, or well, CT, was it the C8 period GT3, and then the Mustang GT3 doesn't go away from Ravel's sort of core values too much. I know right. it's a hot rod or a muscle car, but they've done that type of material before. So it's not stepping way out of the ballpark. And at the same time, I think, well, you know, founding a whole new company would be easier because there's, as I told you today, there's no expectations, right? If I buy Ravel right. and I start making race cars, people are going to lose their absolute crap because it's not hot rods and, and, and muscle cars and drag cars. What the hell is this guy doing making BMWs and Lamborghinis? We don't do that here. 
think, I think buying an established company, uh, this, guys, this is all fantasy, of course. Buying an established company gives you two things. You have the institutional knowledge of how to actually make a model kit. Like I can sit here and we can discuss the business aspect of model kits and what happens with tooling. And I understand all of those things, but it's something that I have physically never participated in. So right. having employees who actually know how to get the ideas out of my head onto into CAD, onto tooling steel, and spit a model kit out the end is, inv is invaluable. Because then if I don't have those, I have to go hire those people. Find those right. people and hire them. And two would be, I said earlier, Revell's been around since the 1960s. When you go to approach a licensor about something, you go, well, I'm Revell. We've been around since 1962. Oh, you right. know, we're, you're just continuing a relationship with us at this point. We've licensed GM since, you know, the or, well, really Mopar, because some of those early kits were, you know, Dodges and stuff like that. We've been licensing with you get, since we started in, in out in California. Like, we're just, we're just a new ownership at the same great company. And, you know, here we go, la di -da. It's very hard to license things as a new company, you know. If you ask oh, sure. guys like Salvino's, like getting those licenses to do stuff, it's it's rolling now for them. It's five years in, but those first couple of years were, you know, pretty hit and miss on trying to get stuff done. Now you have people contacting you, like the IndyCar stuff they're doing. They're making a whole series of one twenty scale IndyCars, probably coming out in May. I'm gonna guess say, and IndyCar approached them. Hey, oh, really? I would you like to be involved in a project with us to develop model kits of Indy cars compared to, you know, banging on NASCAR's door, please let us license, you know, this <laughs> dog that is old Mobile 442 so we can produce a model kit. And, you know, if you had a billion dollars, you could hire the right people to get around all those obstacles, I suppose. But I think there's a, there's a quite a bit of just ease of buying something that exists. And then the third thing, like I said, is the reissue catalog. Obviously, Ravel. You know, you can reissue whatever you need to reissue to quote unquote print your money. Every, you know, that's what Revell does every nine, ten years or so. The site that gets cycle through and go out to what effectively is a new generation. When you think about it, every ten years or so, that's a whole another generation right. of hobbyists. At that point, there's a lot of a lot of us older folks that are like, oh god, the tenth reissue of the heavy Chevy or the this or that the other thing. Yeah, for us, but for you know somebody coming in or coming back, it's the first time they've seen it in twenty years or whatever. Right. But your idea was you want to make the next uh, 3D printing company, if I recall. Yeah. So two things. Either uh, go into business with our friend Wen Ben, who's just starting his decal and resin business, and hire on you know a whole group of designers to make the the cottage industry uh, resin kits. You know, with the multimedia, with the photo etched and the turned aluminum and all that good stuff. Just the high end kits. But that would be, then I would be competing against Alpha Model and and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Creative Hitmark. Master, CMC. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, but those guys are diecast, though, right? I think so. I'm not sure I've seen anything of theirs in other mediums yet, but you never know. Like DDA, the guys that are in Australia that are making some of those Australian cars. They were a diecast company, and now they've started putting plastic through those molds and are right. making. Ford Falcons and older Holdens and stuff like that. Do you know, I know that like, like when Ben made a hundred of his, of his new kit coming out and they cast those, do you think that the casting is silicone or do you think that they're casting it out of something more durable so that they can get a hundred pieces out of it? I, I've often wondered that. I haven't actually quizzed any of those guys to see because, you know, the thing you always heard about was the silicone molds good for 50 pulls or so before it starts deteriorating. Right. But, you know, the other thing with that is your master is 3D printed on that, so you're not worrying about, you know, destroying something oh. hand built. You know, right. like you, would, you, you have a point. The, the yeah. model house days, the, the all American model days where you were built physically building a model kit and then trying to cast a master off of it. And you set the master back and the mold wore out. Now, what do we do? Kind of thing. Right. Yeah. They're, if they're the 3D damage. printing the masters, then they can make as many molds as they want. Yeah. I, I, because, th uh, I think I saw today, now it might have been a misprint for those guys, but, uh, one of the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Alpha models they tend to do on Facebook on an, on a given day was that the new F1 car they're doing was going to be 300 copies instead oh, of 100. Wow. Okay. So 
I mean, I know it's the championship. I think it's the championship Ferrari or not Ferrari, but the uh, Red Bull car from a couple the years Red ago. Right. So, I mean, I understand the popularity involved in that car specifically compared to others, but you know, I, I mean, they know their market better than I do. I can't tell them, you know, what they need to do or what they're not doing with like that top secret Supra. It's fifty bucks less than the other kits have been recently. I don't know if that means all kits are going to get price adjusted down. I don't think the F1 car is, but the F1 cars got like five sheets of carbon fiber decals that might, you know, keep that price propped up a little bit. Yeah, I wonder with that new price point of one fifteen, if if that's going to be the new norm, or maybe they'll just have you know two price points, one sixty and one fifteen, depending on how much detail is in it. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean. I, I, I kind of expected that top secret car to be a tr more of a trans kit, you know, just be the, the body oh, right. or whatever, and fit it to the old Tamiya kit because some of their the guys are out there are like, what the hell is he talking about? But <laughs> some of the, the some of those right. yeah, some of those Nissan GTR the, the R35 GTR trans kits they did were a body and stuff, but you still needed the Tamiya GTR to build those. Right. And I think um couple of the supra trans kits i think you need those the, to be a supra guts to build those so i'm surprised it wasn't that for what the price is because it is a full kit it has chassis in it and everything so right they reissued what the 911 gt3 rs and they reissued the ferrari sp2 and they the the, the monza, monza yeah yeah and then the what else there's one of the well they're reissued they're they've been advertising the sf90 stradale uh today but they haven't lowered the prices on those, and those are repops of something you think they would have made their money out of because they would have sold a hundred or two hundred of them already. So, right. I'm intrigued, but you know, I see your point. I would just, uh, I, I prefer to be on the uh, legal side of things. <laughs> You're going to run a 3D print company, uh, or are you going to pay to license the cars? Because at that point, I think the, you know, the the price of those 3D prints ends up skyrocketing. And right, I'm, not sure, right. I'm, not, I'm not sure where you, where the model companies would be on that at this, or not model companies, but the one to one car companies would be on at this point. Because, you know, how many of them are you going to sell? I don't know, a bunch, maybe, kind of, sort of, because so many of those licenses are based on like a volume uh, point. Like we're going to make five thousand pieces, and you get, you know, a dollar, two dollars off every one of the pieces that we make. Ugh, I dropped my bottle cap. But uh, so my other idea would be, <laughs> excuse me. Here. To have a print farm and have a group of designers make 3D files for like almost on demand. Say, I want a 1963 Pontiac Ventura convertible, and I would have a group of designers, you know, find find the car, sketch it up, make 3D files for it, and send people their 3D files for them to print on their 3D printers. That I think that would be a, a neat venture it probably wouldn't be cheap it'd probably be you know maybe a hundred bucks for the files but you know you're you're paying that too many resin too many projects resin guy mm -hmm. you're giving him a hundred bucks for a body and some bumpers so yeah i, I think so I think selling the files would be an easier way to dance around the lawyers because you're just like, I just made a design file. I can't control what these people <laughs> do. Yeah, exactly. I don't know nothing about nothing. I was just, <laughs> I was a lottery and I decided I needed to learn how to CAD and this is the result of it. I can't control other people. Yeah, I, I would just, I would need to run some kind of a business, but not sit in a hobby shop all day long waiting for people to come in. That would be like death for me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, at some point, someone's going to take over Becker's thing. And I, I, in the back of my head, it's always been like, haha, it'd be fun to run a hobby shop. But like, do you really want to sit there? Because, you know, John's got his kids and his wife and a couple of, of old guys that help him run that place. And they, he hired a couple of younger kids now to help out with all the Gundam stuff that he does. But like, you know, his life is tied up and dragging that crap to every show and within 500 miles and everything else. And I mean, the whole point of right. him opening the brick and mortar store was supposed to be for him to stop going to so many shows. And I don't think he's reduce his show count at all to be honest so right right yeah he, he sits in his big comfortable chair all day long and just collects money yeah right, you need a bag your uh <laughs> your, your your kid making a point here 3d scanners camera to make the initial base file would take save a lot of designing time too absolutely absolutely 
And we're starting to see that in, in actual scale modeling now where, you know, the, the, the famous controversy as it was about the 71 Mustang was the fact that they accidentally uploaded that picture of them 3d scanning the car way, way early in that process. And then everybody, you know, ran around in circles demanding to know where the car was for so long. But finally that's, you know, becoming a thing where, Instead of going yeah. out there with, a, with a ruler measured in white and black every every two inches, it's actually you know three D scanning. I think yeah. the portability of it, it it's like any technology, right? The portability it's more affordable now to just have that stuff done. And then and then the the modelers can't complain about oh that's that's the wrong shape or you know that's the wrong angle. And no, no, sir, we scanned it. We know, we know that's right. I've seen a lot of uh, commentary we've seen. I've seen some commentary from some of the uh, lesser friendly uh, pages to like Salvino's JR. And they'll be <laughs> like, oh, these new next gen cars, they're all proportionally incorrect. I'm like, they got the CAD data directly from NASCAR. Like they're, they're as, as accurate as they're going to be. Should it, should things maybe be massaged to look right? Because to me, has always been real famous about that. Like you can 3D scan a car, but what it looks like when it comes out may not look right to your eye in that smaller dimension. But like those cars are accurate. They're they're physically made from the, the the CAD files. They took those CAD files and they overlaid them into the you know their design software, and out the door they went. Like they're as accurate as anything. You may right. not, you know, that's all camera angles anyway, right? Right. I, I had a conversation with with somebody else today, somebody a friend of our mutual friend up to the north there about the the correctness of the fluorescent red versus pink of that new decal sheet. Uh, oh. And I and I, I told him the same thing I was telling you. I'm like, that's a white balance on the camera thing. Like I've literally the more we talked about, the more research I did on it, and I've seen probably photos from a dozen different sources of that car, both at the Tokyo Auto Salon and then at that GSR has taken out of test days. And depending on who takes a picture of that car, what the lighting looks like, and what camera they were using, that pink red is different hues. I can't find two of them that match. I don't think you, you a, could prove that your paint job is any more right or wrong than anybody else's. You know. Do you have a Do you have a picture for our audience? They may be lost. Oh, uh, let me see here. Probably not. In the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll I read can't your remember comments. what. I say I can't remember what can't what, what computer I was on when I was talking to you. I'll go look here. We have a special guest. If Tim Custom is online, welcome, <laughs> Tim. Uh, Frank's model works. They'll still complain. Yes, they will. Yes, they ah, will. Frank. <laughs> I'm glad to see more has untied you from the, the furnace tonight. <laughs> JK, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that 90 Mustang. Uh, I have no ties to Rebel, so I'll, I'll call a spade a spade. That is that is an awful, awful. Yeah. I, I can't believe they put that out. It looks like they squashed it. Okay. Oh, the info! Oh God, that set the that that car that kit set the the internet on fire on like uh, right model cars magazine. We 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 must have spent something in the neighborhood of a month. People got thrown off the forum and <laughs> over that. Like it was it was ugly in every way you could imagine because that kit that car is two inches too low in scale. Right, it. right. So, like a like a mercury chop or something. <laughs> yeah, yes, Tim, you are a special guest. <laughs> so um so I don't know if you guys noticed, but we have a new logo. Um I can't share it. I don't know how to do that. He knows how to do it. But anyways, <laughs> um so our friend Eric Ritz, um I, I called him one day and I said, I need a logo for our podcast and I have no idea what just you're the artist. You 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 do it. You know, I, I trust you, Eric. And he came up with this great logo and uh I'm happy with it. It's it's everything we needed. Thank you, Eric. If you're watching, you're probably not. <laughs> hang on, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. So check it out. We got a tire, automotive podcast, we got a microphone. Simple. Perfect, simple. I showed it to my wife uh, right before I came downstairs, and she was like, "That I like that." She actually didn't know we had named it that. And I said, uh, "The reason, the reason, well, not the reason. Well, we were thinking about names. We we're thinking about names, and I was looking for things. And a couple of different ideas I had. I actually searched for podcasts by those names, and there were already podcasts by those names. And it's like, 
I don't want to be the second one of the third one of something, even if the other podcasts are small too. And I said, right. what about just like something basic and simple? And believe it or not, guys, in the one one car world, there's not something called the automotive podcast. You, there's like thousands of car podcasts, and none of them are just called the car podcast. So, like, all right, I'm stealing that name while we have the opportunity to grab it. Well, like, um, like Matthew over at Model Car Videos. I mean, that was genius. It was oh, genius. very to start very easy to channel. remember that. Oh, Mr. Brolin's online. Very good, nice. No, oh, John's done paying his bills for the night. He told me the other day, he's like, I keep meaning to watch that, but I pay my bills on Monday night. I was like, well, pay your bills on Tuesday night. We're more important than your electric. Come on. <laughs> so we, we have a I, question. Well, I cannot for the life of me find a 2024 good small racing picture, so I'm not going to sit there. And do, you ever think, do you ever think Hot Wheels would team up and make a Diora 2 or Twin Mill model kit? I always thought it would be an obvious opportunity for more models. You know, I think you're right. Um, that's that's a neat uh, custom, and I think that they've kind of dropped the ball in not making a model of that. I think it would sell. All right. I didn't, I, I, we didn't actually talk about this, but uh, so I'll put you on the spot here, but uh, would we buy this uh, since we talked last? <laughs> you, you went to shows, so you had to buy stuff, right? I did. I did. Hold on. Um, I didn't have this, so I grabbed it. It was fifteen bucks. Good price. Yeah, that's a good price. Especially um, considering the the James Bond reissue, that would have cost like forty. Right. Right. And I bought a Toyota Supra. Did you not have one of those yet? Yeah, I have a green one right here. Oh, okay. Um, I built that. That was my first car on the channel. And uh, it was, it, the videos are horrible. I took them off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we need a special anniversary episode of Scam Model. I think so. I think so. I tell you what, James. 10,000 subscribers on my channel and we will do, <laughs> we will do a roast. You and I will do a roast oh, of my first video. I'll I'll like go that. back and look at the, look at some of my first videos. <laughs> I think the first I think that my first video is literally called like Asian kit releases for the summer or something like that. I was just trying to catch up with what was coming <laughs> and what was what was scheduled. So yeah, that's a that's a doozer. Um, one other thing I bought, but I put it in a sealed bag and took it to the basement. I bought pearl powder. So I got it in these one ounce bottles, and it's straight pearl powder in three colors. Um, and I think you put like a pinch in like two ounces of clear, mix it up and shoot it over black and it'll be a vibrant um, paint job. But um, the green, <laughs> James pointed it out, the green bottle that I had actually had um, pearl on the black cap. So he must have had it on his fingers when he was filling them <laughs> and got it on the cap. And he goes, James says, your entire workbench is now contaminated with pearl powder, and everything is going to be pearl from now on. I think you're right. I said, you're everything right. shall everything shall be metallic from this day forward. Right. So when I do mix that pearl powder, I think I'm going to do it outside, not in my paint booth area, or else I'll get it in everything. You um, need to grab Frank. All the kidding we do about Frank being a new channel and all stuff like that. He just was doing pearl stuff the other day, mixing pearls in the clear to see if he could get a tint that he wanted. So, oh yeah, I, I would get a hold of him because okay. he seems to, seems to know what he was doing, or at least okay. kind of made, made a good, a valiant effort of seeming like he knew what he was doing. <laughs> and the um, at the Columbus show, I broke down and I bought the 007. Ah, oh, the U.S. boxing. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I opened it up, and the the pieces that I don't want, the uh, the roof piece, oop, there it is, the roof piece and the um, bulletproof shield for the back are separate pieces on a separate tree, which tells me they're going to tool up a new body and just leave these pieces out. Only I think there's going to be a only thing you would need is a top half of that body mold because the rest of it you could recycle. It right, very right. very cheap. And for those who don't who don't know what I'm talking about, that 
I don't want to fill that or this. Right, because if you look where the seams are on that, obviously the top half of that mold is where those holes are. Oh, right. A seam right down this front that, here. Yeah. Where that two things sandwiched together. So that mold, yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to see a stock version. So I'll go ahead and build the James Bond. Um, it's the snap together, so I could probably do it in a month. <laughs> We're holding you to it because you have nothing. You have no bills of 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 like sponsored content type of things coming. So you have plenty of time. Nothing, right. nothing but free calendar for James Tester as far as the eye can see. Trying to finish up this alpha alpha model uh, Audi. I'm about sixty uh, percent done with that, and then I got a BMW Z4 to do immediately after, and then the Fast and Furious car after that, and then. Maybe another Z4 after that. So I'm tied up till June. I say, and then Secret Squirrel Project in there as well. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and that's been talk about that. Yeah. So on my end, I have a few more. All right. So, so what did you buy? Um, over at SK Decals, Frankie has done number of sheets for the. Oops. Let me see. That's good sit up and then i almost ripped my head set out of the thing so this kit came out a few a few months ago now well i'm too close this bmw okay. 320 it's got the camera to focus uh yep. there we go 2008 car so he's made some decals for this which include uh the team germany car so this is uh augustus farfus who's a still fairly famous bmw uh, fuck. yeah he's still a bmw factory driver even at this point so it's a you know basic paint your car white and your decals you know the like the top of the decals, oh yeah okay. the trunk, trunk lid and stuff like that all your green is is decals basically so that you don't have to really go a whole heck of a lot this I'm not sure which which race technically I think this is the race of Brazil uh, as far as the logo is on the back I'm gonna show you more of this this instruction sheet here in a second and then he also did the Team UK one which is Andy I think it's Prelax I think a pre Okay, for, I can never pronounce that name. It's like P-R-A-U-L-X. That's a very British name if ever there was one, right? Mm. So it's a Crown Plaza sheet. I just like their colors. Crown Plaza sponsored BMWs up through the Z4 years. We have uh, to the first one there. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, this is a team rack. Um, I was to uh, the, the number of people who yell at me that it's the Royal Automotive Club. Stop calling it rack when I talk about the rally right. version of it. This is this is not that same thing, but this was uh, the 2009 British Touring Car Championship uh, car driven by uh, Colin Turkington. Colin Turkington won the championship in 2009. He was the first driver of Northern, Northern Ireland uh, descent to ever win in anything in British Touring Car. So it's a nice safety orange car. Not a lot, Ooh, all right. Was, but I like the Chevron in the back there. It's very ambulancey, police car-y, fire trucky. And then this one is the the like the uh, chef's kiss. Even though it didn't do very much, uh, was I think we entered it in four rounds in the end of two thousand eight World Touring Car Championship. So this is the endless uh, BMW. Oh, okay, that's a brake company, right? Right. Yeah, and it's got this uh, like multicolored. Uh, Panther Ooh, that sits that's in the what side. I'm down for. Complicated. And uh, let me open it up here because I actually haven't even had a chance to look at it. The main decal sheet is you know its own thing, but these Panthers are their own separate. Ooh, yeah, I like complicated decal schemes. <laughs> so yeah, the decal seems itself not very. Not you know terribly much. It's just a couple of you know numbers and stuff like that. Paint the car blue, right. but I like that. I like that livery. The car. If you get pictures, find pictures of the real car, it's it's nice. But it's a shame the car didn't do better performance wise. But you know, case of Ross racing, right? It's a, it's always going to be something that's uh, man. I really wish we could have done better this year, but the old endless brakes BMW 320i just didn't perform real well. So the thing I wanted to show you, if I can find, here we go. I'll take a pretty the, car over a fast car anytime. <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, this is the the full decal sheet for that that British car I just showed you? And the thing that's cool about this is that Frankie went through 
And there's not a lot of variation here, guys. I understand that we're picking nits as far as like what goes on here, but he created decals for you to do every single. Let me zoom in a little bit. So, race of Brazil and the race of Mexico, the race of Spain, France, Czech Republic, Portugal, UK, Germany, Europe, race of Japan, race of Italy, race of Macau, and along with a sheet down here that tells you what goes on what car. Okay. So, this might be the first time I'm aware of that is for Frankie anyway, where he's gone through and you could build this, that car and this, uh, the, the, the one for Farfus in like any race of the season. Okay. A lot of times right. you end up with, with like, Hey, this is a really cool color. So we, I built it for, I, I made decals for the car I could find pictures of. And oftentimes that car you can find pictures of, that's not the car that won, right? It's, it's another car that ran. And so he gives you the opportunity to, like, ah, any race you want to make. So you want to make them all Macau, you can do that. You want to make them the cars that won the actual individual racing, you know, the races. Because both those cars, they did okay, but they won specific, you know, races through the years. You can make the specific cars. And on the kit side of thing, we picked up uh, the Alpha Models RS6 Avante. That's neat. So this is the sports wagon version of the car that, James just showed you he was building. Same 700 horsepower drivetrain, everything else is just in a shooting break instead of being a hatchback. So this Good one enough. is out of production. This is out of production. It took me a little bit of finagling to, to basically pry it out of Canada, but uh, managed to pick that one up, and that was the one, one Audi of their stuff I was missing. I couldn't imagine driving a car like that and having 700 horsepower underneath your your foot, you know, with heated and cooled seats and, you know, <laughs> and double pane glass. Turn in you know? my serious, yeah, turn in my serious, air condition my seats. And, right. you know, this, this one, one of my favorite uh, 962 Porsches that, that Hasegawa has done in the series of many 962C Porsches at this point, it is the porno car. Oh, the porno car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, I, I said in the the, the, the uh, monthly video when this came out, this is an, Hasegawa loves to fill the box tar, our top. Like they will shove as many words as necessary to make that banner go the whole way across. <laughs> like WEC. So this is the World Endurance Cha Championship. It was the Group C version uh, of like the, the global Group C because there's a Japan Group C that's secondary. And why that's like WEC in Japan, Fuji 1,000 kilometers. Like, why? The Fuji 1,000 kilometers is the WEC race in Japan. It's not like there's two, not like there's ten. There's just the one. Extraneous, but yes. This is like 1980s awesomeness here. So you got Super CAD, which was like a big, you know, computer-aided design company at the time. You have, uh, you have Rizla on there. That's French rolling papers. It's not illegal. <laughs> it's tobacco-related. <laughs> and then, of course, yeah, you've got Penthouse all over this thing. So this... <laughs> Didn't do particularly well in this race. It finished like 20th. I think somebody made this just to see if they could get away with putting penthouse on a model kit and selling it. <coughs> but uh, yeah, that's a that's a fun one for you know putting it on the IPMS table and see if anyone complains. What you can't see in that box art, it actually makes for kind of an interesting card. The whole top of the car has like silver pinstriping. Oh, so, like, so, like, the, so, like over the front, over the roof, over this the the side engine intakes and all that stuff. This whole thing has like silver pinstripes going over the top of it, and there's I no good picture that. of it that you'd have to be here with me to see it because it's such fine pinstriping. But that no. that makes it like not a just a white car. So I, I can, do like I can that. wrap a whole car in Miku decals all day long, and just don't don't ask me to do a single pinstripe. I can't do them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like so one of the other things that was for sale because I'm just a sucker for Hasegawa rally kits. So here's the 86 Monte Carlo rally. This would be one of the last good finishes for an the non-crazy group B car. Like the 037 came into rallying as a group B car at the very beginning of group B. 86 the last year of group B rally. That's like the the Audi, the suit really souped up Audi that had like 700 horsepower, the, the Delta S4 that had like 700 horsepower. The year that they killed spectators and drivers were dying, and the cars were just, they were all drive and they're 800 horsepower. They couldn't keep the cars on the track and stuff like that. And that ended up being what killed Group B Racing. But this was a, a privateer company entry. So, I mean, it was one of the last, I think they finished third, one of the last really good results for that car. Um, this one I picked up because, speaking of complicated decal schemes, it's the Axia uh, oh. Stunner line. 
So, uh, you know, now James will argue that the 1991 version of this is too close to the 1992 version of this, and so he's not going to buy this because it's the same card. It's the same game. thing. Um, but, yeah, it's... It's... Uh, like, Hasegawa decals are kind of iffy sometimes, so trying to get this all to lay down on the car should be uh, <laughs> a, a fun time, especially, especially <laughs> this one over here, this the entire side of the car. The entire side of the car, yeah. Yeah, and you know, a GTR is not curvy at all, so that'll right. be that'll slide that right was, on there. If that was a NASCAR, it would be a lot easier, but it's not. <laughs> if it was Cartograph decals, it would be a lot easier, or or right. Frankie, or Lau, or Gwen Ben, or anybody who makes good decals. And then the last thing in this box of stuff is uh, the old Nissan Leopard J Fieri, or whatever. Now, the reason why I picked this up is like, who the hell needs a Nissan Leopard J Fieri? Is the fact that this kit still has in it? If I can find. Stuff. What is the US has, equivalent? It still has that? in it the left-hand drive dashboard. It still has in it the left-hand drive wipers, and the like the light the the extra headlights. So this time around, because I think it was missing the last reissue, if I can get it out of here. This kit actually has, and this was a kit that was released back in 1992. I actually have the original boxing of it, but somebody painted it metallic lime green. Is the decal sheet this time around it has the Infinity logos? I was going to ask you what what Infinity is that here in the this US? The J30. Okay, all right. Actually, oh, okay. it has California license plates. Oh, look at that. So. Like I said, I have one of these. Somebody painted it metallic green. I haven't tried to get the paint off it yet. I bought it mainly because it was like, well, well, someday I'll strip the paint off that. And then they reissued it, and it has the actual right decals this time around. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> Maybe not. Got window masks, so you don't have to worry yes. about painting the window surrounds, which is always nice. One of the reasons to buy any A. Oshima kit you already have a copy of from back in the past is the fact that most of the new ones have window masks. Right. And fresh decals and stuff like that. So, yeah, like when am I getting around to that? Who knows? But it was worth the twenty-two dollars. Right, right. So. Let me read some comments here. Um, Frank says, "Get the domain name." So that must be for automotive podcast. Yeah. Uh, Nacho says, "Still paying the bills." Yeah, yeah. I bet we get three D files of the Hot Wheels some days. I bet we do. I bet we do. Or Tim Custom's going to make one out of uh, Volkswagen or something. Only two kits? Yeah, I'm saving my money for New Jersey because that's where all the good stuff is. Uh, what do you guys think about Createx paint? I We were talking on episode two with somebody that, that was real good with the Createx clear, and it caught my interest. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, Onyx is online. Um, whereas custom builds, what's up, guys? Sorry, I'm not a fan of printing. Um, I know a lot of guys do it, but scratch builders need their own class because it's not the same. Cars look the same, and it just looks box stuff. Yeah, I, I, I can see your point. Um, the the 3D print stuff is getting more and more technical, and their the the detail of them is really really good. And they are starting to look more like kits than than just you know a blob of resin. But you scratch builders out there who can make your own frames, and that's that's beyond me. I I'll just stick with box stock at that point. I I can't do it. Um, not sure what we were talking about. Onyx um, done it many times working for Mercedes. Not sure what we were talking about at that time. Um, next, we'll be competing against holograms of virtual reality. <laughs> yeah, you got a point. Um, Nacho says, I have that 962 in my private warehouse, but you'll build it. Sorry, James. Completely agree with warehouse print is not scratch building. Yeah, Tim. Tim's the scratch builder, that's for sure. <laughs> Even printing kits comes down to assembly and painting like a staggering kit, but detail in a printing kit is a bit above staggering. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I will name my next kit after 
Anyone that makes a window mask for late model kits. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Frank. But I ain't Zoom even on. Any kids. Zoom on is kind of a weird name to give your kid. I don't know. <laughs> so. so, James, we have some new kits coming out in April. We do. We do. Um, I made this banner to say this. I don't need that to say that. I need this to say... Uh, let me fix it real quick. And all right, there's still one too much space there. Here we go. Bring that banner back up. It's AM shoot and round two new kit. Right and round two. That's right, because they had some things. We we're gonna we were blatantly stealing screenshots from Mr. Tester's video here. But, uh, yeah, so up first, the Aoshima stuff, because it was the stuff I listed before Detroit's, you know, I made this, I made this banner prior to the weekend, so Detroit hadn't happened yet. Uh, these things will be summer releases. They're like July, August, or July, yeah, July, August, June, somewhere in their time frames, depending on which one of these kids you're talking about. Uh, this will be a lot of their uh, stuff they'll be showing at uh, Shizuka coming in May, right? Now, they'll probably show stuff at Shizuka that we haven't seen at all. There'll be prototypes and new announcements, that sort of thing. These are going to be the actual products that we're focusing on uh, more than not. So this was something shown. Well, actually, I think, no, I guess all of this was technically shown at, at, Shiz, at uh, All Japan in October. always forget. Sharing screens, very important. So here we go. First up, you have their version of the Toyota 80, GR86, or the venerable Toyota 86, or the Scion FRS, if you want to go back far enough in your uh, American history of this. Their kit is going to include a full engine. If you've bought any of the 86 kits in the past from Aoshima, you know that as opposed to the Tamiya kit, which sort of has an iffy top half engine insert okay. the aoshima kit is like a 20 piece engine it doesn't have a bottom to it because the nature of the chassis of an 86 is there's a giant plastic under tray and so they skipped out making the bottom of the engine makes sense you're never going to see it they do have a transmission bottom uh i'd expect this engine to basically effectively be the same because there's not that many changes in the actual car here, right yeah, this the the way this firewall is kind of looks like it's only right hand drive, which would be a shame because the older kits of this oh. have been right hand drive or left hand drive. Uh, then this firewall was flippable because on the real car, the battery and the master brake cylinder switch sides depending on which side the driver sits on. Right. So what well, I, I remain to be seen on what's going on there. There are going to be two releases of this. One will just be a straight. A gr86 and then there's oops i'm trying to scroll and speaking of zooming the other one will be molded in red and it'll have the advan racing gt wheels on it so same kit different wheels your choice i know how much everyone loves a molded in red model it's everyone's most favorite color to get something molded in but uh, but, but oshima they highly polish those molds and and you would you pull that thing out and put a coat of wax on it, and it will look like a two K paint job. Serious. This, this is true. As long as the, as long as your mold lines on here aren't too bad, and uh, it does, it's not a metallic red. <laughs> See a right. mold flow, right. it should be okay. So that's coming out in July. I'll grab one. Maybe it depends on whether or not it's if it's left hand drive. If it's not left hand drive, I already have the Tamiya one. I don't need a second one. Right. Um, God dang it, I keep forgetting if I close the window, it closes the sharing program. <laughs> Dear StreamYard, if you really wanted to make everyone's life a little easier, what we would do would be make it so that <laughs> you can close things without it actually shutting things off entirely. So, uh, <laughs> big announcement, technically speaking, I guess, right? So, next month, supposed to be this month, next month, the DeLorean time machine, the Back to the Future car, is supposed to be coming out. It is a completely and totally brand new tool. Now, there's been a, a DeLorean time machine from all three movies floating around for a while now. AMT released it. If you ever bought the AMT DeLorean, you're buying the Aoshima one in an AMT box. And the I don't have any good pictures of it because it's coming out this month that there's still any good pictures of the like, parts trees and stuff like that. Anyway, 
all of the time machine stuff is separate on this new tool. All of the wiring that's on the outside of the car, all of the time, you know, the flux capacitor on the inside, all that stuff is completely and totally separate. The one thing that the time machine car doesn't have is the rear hatch of the stock car. This piece back right. here, of course, has the Mr. Fusion at the end of the movie. It's got the nuclear reactor in it at the beginning of the movie. It doesn't have the actual back hatch for this car. So what you're seeing here, yes, that's right, is the first time ever in plastic form, a stock, they're calling it a DMC-12, which I know is the, the prototype name, which was never used in production, but this stock DeLorean. I can't tell you um, how giddy this makes me. Mainly, if nothing else, the laziness that is me as a modeler, the reason why I didn't buy the Aston Martin DBS-5 from Ravel is I don't want to fill the roof hole and I don't want to deal with that big hole from the bulletproof thing. I didn't want right. to scratch build a rear deck. I mean, the rear deck for this wouldn't be too terribly hard because I think the frame of the rear deck is in right. the Back to the Future kit, but you'd have to make these louvers. Yeah. Flat out stock. So, the, you know, a lot of people were saying new tool, new tool. Technically speaking, yes, it's a new tool because it's the new tool Back to the Future. But this really legitimately is just going to have a rear engine deck lid added to it. And otherwise, it would be the parts you would get in the new Back to the Future kit, because the Back to the Future kit skull wing doors open too. Mm -hmm. So this is August, probably end up being September. Everything I show makes always a month late for some reason. But yeah, mm -hmm. I'm I'm dancing in the streets about this one because I've it's a stupid car. They only made like a hundred of them. <laughs> I hope that um, that Aoshmason doesn't get arrested for international drug trafficking. I hope they don't outsource <laughs> production in Northern Ireland. But yeah, I am I'm stoked. Yeah, I'm really stoked about that one too. And I'm not painting it silver. <laughs> I I think it would be kind of interesting to see if you could actually make something look like brushed aluminum though, because like the finish of that car, you know, it looks like it's been swept with a broom almost with the finish. So I don't know how right. you replicate that in scale. Uh, brush see. paint, we had a big wide brush. brush. <laughs> yeah, get one of those big fan brushes. And so the other thing, this one just got shown up today as a second version of the newer tool because this just came out last late last fall. Is right. uh, a Liberty Walk Mercy Lago or Mercy Lagio, depending on how you want to pronounce that. This one has a uh, different front bumper, different like. Uh, splitter to the front end has a different rear spoiler and i believe the wheels are different here as well okay. um cast in the color you want to paint your aventador <laughs> that's why i said earlier this will match your uh pzy kit box aventador I mean, it's an interesting color i'm very interested to see what that ends up looking like i, I don't know that i necessarily order one because i have the white one they did and so oh, was it white or was it red no the, the original one's white the, okay. The first right. one. Um, I I don't know that I I, I care enough about this the this the, again the splitter and the spoiler to grab a second one considering how expensive these things are. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested to see what that looks like when it comes out, just because of the whole uh you know we just, I just said metallic mold you know slosh. If you ever right. any anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, guys, anytime you get a metallic kit, usually you can see where the mold where the plastic flow comes together because there'll be a line in the metallic. Uh, mold yeah. plastic where the two where the mold fills meet each other. This will be really really obvious on this because <laughs> it's a nice bright color. It's like silver. It shows right. everything. So yeah, I mean, but you know, it's it's another it's another Mercy Elagio. It's another you know one of their. Uh, they're not calling them new kits, are they? They're just Liberty Walk kits. They don't have an attachment name to them, but yeah. So that's <laughs> that's coming. I'm and looking then, forward uh, to that. That's a nice car. Yeah, like I said, I have the white one. I don't know that I need a second one. I I, I bought both of the Aventadors, both the Hurricanes, and I ended up selling one of each because I'm never going to build them both. So, uh, Over to Mr. Tester and his wonderful videography. Uh, <laughs> let me see. I want to do this in an order. So uh, first thing that they showed, we'll lose the screen sharing for a second, is this one and this i think will be the most i think this is technically the one that'll come first out of all this stuff and that is the upcoming 64 malibu chevy what is it chevy chevelle malibu chevelle. sf right and this is going to be a another curbside plus or uh crafts what are they calling this craftsman. craftsman craftsman plus yeah um so know that that know that going in, it's curbside, no engine. It does have a, like a radiator support and a firewall, looks like, and right. uh, simplified 
uh, parts count, and it's going to be in one of those little boxes that the Craftsman Plus gets that's been coming in. I want one just because of the, you know, why not, right? <laughs> it's it's a, that's legitimately where I am with that. I want one because why not? Uh, I know that this will again cause this this the the s storm of controversy about the fact that there's no engine, there's the metal asshole. They charge the same amount for this one as they do for one with an engine in it. <sighs> again, uh, it's gonna have a hole in the chassis. It's gonna have a firewall and a, and a radiator. Put your own damn engine in it. The, right. And not as I say, not to discount the scratch building guy, but you know, 3D printing is what it is now at this point. You can get any any engine from any manufacturer in any cylinder alignment you could possibly want and cram it on in there and, and make it your own. Uh, right. these 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 craftsman plus kits really are great. I mean, you can build them out of the box as a weekend thing, right? It's just a throw it together, you know, paint it kind of thing. Uh, maybe a weekend's too ambitious for for Mr. Tester there, but you know it's it's a couple <laughs> it's a couple week project, right? It's real quick, real easy to do, and it's a new tool, so you don't have to worry about not fitting and things of that nature. Or it's a it's a giant canvas. Well, not giant canvas. It's a one twenty fifth scale canvas, but it's a giant canvas for doing whatever you want to do to it. You can make it whatever you want it to be. The 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 lack of parts, if you will, is a freeing if you in a certain aspect because what oh, I don't really want to build the engine out of the kit, but do I really want to buy a three D motor? Well, no. If you want to build an engine in this, you got to buy something else or kit bash it with something else or scratch build right. it in some form or fashion. So most people would it, do it anyways. So let's say make it your own. It'll be you know it's they're they're slightly less than the than a full size kit price. Calm down. Relax, it'll be okay. I promise. <laughs> the uh, the second thing that came out, and this is uh, probably next next in the next line, and that is because this is a couple of new parts in it this time around, and that is a reissue of the sixty two Pontiac. Was it a four twenty one SD? Right. So this is going to have a newly tooled Pontiac Bonneville grill, and. They're kind of blurry. Because again, yeah. It's a screenshot of a video, guys. They're the new eight lug wheels and brakes, from what I understand. So you're going to get the the actual brakes that are heavy duty brakes, and then you're getting the eight lug wheels that are new. I think that's a nice little, probably cost them addition seven thousand yeah. dollars or so to tool up those parts. Nice little addition to it to make it not be what it always has been for the last twenty five years, right. and. From reading, you know, the the comments about it, apparently swapping the Bonneville grill was a very popular thing to do on the real one to one sixty twos when they were drag racing. So that'll certainly open that option up to people who are looking to build specific versions of this car. It's got a new decal sheet in it and stuff like that. I already have a four twenty one SD. I don't think I necessarily need a second one. Although the the idea of having eight lug wheels is kind of tempting. Um, might, be, might, might be time to throw the one I have on there up on the auction for five bucks and see what uh, see what we get out of the, the yeah. Yeah. yeah I like it. Don't get me wrong, I like it. I just don't know that I necessarily need. That's it was my eh, if you ever watch my videos. It's not like oh that's a bad thing. I don't want it. It's like eh, do I really want to spend the money on that? Eh, I don't. Maybe maybe not. Yeah, Frank says he's going to buy that Pontiac just for the wheels. This is a little blurrier than I thought when I looked when I took at it, but so they're gonna get the, the next version of the Ford Bronco. Um, the this Overland. is gonna be the, the is it the Overland? I thought it was the Outer Banks. Uh, I think it's Overland. All right, well, sure. Outer Banks, Overland, one of the, it's another trim package for the Bronco. Um, you're gonna get a new set of wheels in this and then a, the, the new grill. Um, mm -hmm. that uh, Sven accidentally showed you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you guys watch the uh, Sean video that he showed his build of it and it has yeah. the new grill in it. So, another version of the Bronco, you knew that was coming because obviously they didn't tool up Can't a brand just new do one. Right. It's going to be two, three. And then I think the big, the big money shot here, I don't get this at all. I will fully admit I am too young for this model kit. And I'm certainly, if you guys watch know anything about me, not the target audience for this, but it has been very popular on the forums as something coming back. And that this is a reissue, but it's sort of cobbled together with a bunch of new parts of the uh, yeah the Oldsmobile F85 Streaker Funny Car. So you're like, oh, what the heck here? So you need the new body out of the convertible that they made mm -hmm. for the body, 
a lot of the inserts for this still existed from the 1960s. If you look, if you ever have sat around and looked online, there's an article they did about round two, right when they bought out AMT, and they had all of these kits on coat hangers, and they were sprue shots of the entire tool. And the body of this was not in it because they had modified the body. And now you're getting the parts added back to the new body. And then the chassis didn't exist for it because the chassis underneath this is underneath a whole bunch of the older wheelbase cars. And that got lost. Now you're saying, well, where the hell did the chassis come from? Well, you may recall the Time Machine Chevelle just older wheelbase car just came out. That was a new tool replication of an old kit. And that, my friends, is what is the chassis that is underneath of this thing. Yep. It's that chassis which fits that body like a glove, let me tell you. Yeah, Steve was so nice to flip that over for me. Don't know who would want to build this thing. But again, for a uh, certain demographic out there, I know this is a, a big, huge deal. So I'm happy for them because, hey, anything that sells well is more money for stuff that I'm interested in. And uh, this has been, sure. again, again, something that a lot of people have been saying, well, hey, you know, the chassis back in the time machine and the body was just retooled for this. And then the, 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 this part was added and that if you took all of these parts and combined them together, you would have, well, yeah, you read the tea leaves. You kind of sort of knew this would show up eventually. So. Right. Now, Sean, are... the, the Sean video, if you, if you look through his case, he built a Hearst version mm -hmm. of, a... of a topless, uh, olds and I think that was that was really nice. I don't know what year it was or you know if you could use this kit, but that would be that would be something I would be interested in. I built a Hemi on a glass years ago, but uh, yeah, that would be kind of neat. So for the folks that are interested, that's coming. Yeah, also on the table was the police charger, but that's coming out should be out before the end of the month, maybe. Very uh, soon. Yeah, the fifty-seven. Uh, Chrysler 300C Custom was there. That is a reissue of the, I think only once, maybe twice issued 300C Custom kit. And then the 71 Dodge uh, Hemi Charger was there, which I like is sort of a few pieces and parts out of the Custom Hemi that was done yeah, back in the those awful night. wheels. Yeah. <laughs> which had some really awful wheels. The box art for that thing sold absolutely zero of those kits in, in real life. But uh, right. combining it into and sort of making a slightly different version of the 71 Charger, I think that'll, that'll end up selling pretty well. I sold my 71 Charger specifically to buy the new one when it comes out. So yeah, yeah. New set of decals will probably include the right decals in it this time with the stripes in it. And uh, Correct. That, that's something, I'm, something the closet Mopar fan over here is looking forward to. So when I was talking with Steve at the show, they did correct the decals so that they they lay right now um the previous version they didn't lay very well um it's got the hemi from the custom kit it's got the machine gun tips from the the custom kit and the uh the air grabber hood as well from the the custom kit but all the rest is the the stock rt kit just very cool um so, i i think i kit bashed the the two of them together to, to make that exact kit long ago trendsetter before it was cool <laughs> somebody made a super b hood scoop that i molded into the hood i think it was ken schmidt made that uh war is custom build saying any low rider versions i think technically the 57 chrysler is lowered it's not a low rider but it's lowered and yeah. then the thing that was right above it in those box art was the 60 uh chevy pickup the street machine version of it, which they're selling as a custom this time around, which again is lowered with right. uh, a bunch of custom parts added to it. That kit, as far as I know, is only I've ever been done once. It was released in 1999, and I don't think it was ever reissued ever again after that. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's a kit that when it comes out, a lot of people are regularly like, what is this? Well, they tooled up new stuff. No, no, it just... It, 1999 was that point where the... the, the Round two got sold, or uh, AMT Auto got sold to Racing Champions. The production was moved to Mexico, and almost all of their 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 product line was sold at Walmart. And that thing went over like a fart in a church, and it sort right. of this. I mean, because the '57 Custom that I don't think that that got I think one reissue somewhere in the RC2 era, but it's only been out one, the one time originally. I think one time after that, and then okay. the hem, the Custom 71 Charger that's never been reissued. Right. So right. a lot of those 
alternate versions of those late Mueller era kits. They've never been seen. There's a whole whole slew of people that have never actually seen those kits ever. Right. Anybody new yeah. to the hobby in, in the last 10, 15 years hasn't seen those kits at all. I, you know, I don't think they were necessarily bad. The, the 701 Charger is particularly dated. Those wheels were stamped uh -huh. <laughs> 1998 from, from Russia with Love kind of thing. But otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah so that's that is that little bit of the show. Um, upcoming shows, there are only a couple that I'm aware of for August. I did take a look around, or August, April. April. And they are, if I can find my folder, that's that's a folder, but not the one I'm looking for. There are three shows. Car-specific shows, shall we say. And they are God, there's, I wish there was an easier way to get through this. The Midwest Model Vehicle Association, so this is St. Louis, Missouri area. April 21st, I guess they do a show also in November. But there's a okay. there's a model, it says a whole bunch of stuff here, but there is a model car contest added to the back of it. Uh, so if you're in the St. Louis area, you might want to take a look into this one. I know that uh, this is on the list of things that STS decals is doing, so... Must have a, a reasonably large vendor area for a, you know somebody to travel from Ohio to St. Louis to, to vend at. So that is coming up. And then the Kansas Auto Modeler Society. So if you want to go over to another state the week and before that is doing their show. This is in Salina, Kansas on April the 13th. I didn't take a picture of the of the actual postcard, but I think we've all got one by now. If you registered at NNL East last year, you've got the little postcard for NNL East this year. That is Saturday, April 28th, so the last weekend of the month. You can come meet your famous podcast hosts along with, uh, you know, 1,500 of your other best friends all clambering for the C1 resin tables as soon as the doors open. <laughs> but I assume Chris is coming. I don't know for sure. I haven't asked him, but... Uh, if you haven't been to NNL East and you're vaguely in the New Jersey area, make the trip down for the day. It's relatively impossible to find if you've never been there before, but other, <laughs> otherwise, uh, you know, it's a good time. It's the only show I know of, and I've been to a slew, that the line goes around the building in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that about an hour before the, the show opens, the line starts, and it just wraps all the way around the building. But they're really fast about you. You almost pre-register in line. Yeah. They'll pass off. Yeah, yeah, and Christmas. you pay. You pay in line, and uh, so when they open the door, you're just like walking right in, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> Frank says, so "I'll be in at least be the fat nerd with glasses, so we fit right in." Uh, <laughs> He'll be this. Oops, he'll be the skinny nerd with glasses. I'll be the fat nerd with no with contacts. Um, <laughs> by the way, the, the the hint, the secret hint to that is, if you get there and there's a line around the building, you can walk up to the very front, pay, and then go hang out in line and talk to people, and then everybody files in, let the room cool off for about fifteen minutes, and you go walk in after everybody. You don't actually stand in that line. They will sell you your admission at the front desk there, right where the door is, and you don't have to like you know, know stand that. there. Yeah, but can you get the the wooden nickel? Yeah, they gave you the bag. I mean, the, the okay. wooden nickels aren't in everybody's bag; they're only in certain ones. But they'll right. give you your wristband, your little bag, and then they'll they'll either give you the forms to fill out for your models, but you can go online and print those out and have yeah. filled out ahead of time. It's just the easier way to go about life, anyway. For for those of you who've never been to NNL East, they give you a goodie bag. It usually has some photo etched license plates and some other, you know, just kitschy kind of stuff. But some in some bags is a wooden nickel, which is good for five dollars off anything in the vendor area, which is a deal. So yeah, it's it's just something kind of fun. I've never won one yet. I've been going no, for seven, I, I seven eight years. <laughs> All right. And so if you're sitting there, you're thinking to yourself, why'd they stop the show to talk about shows when there's only three shows? Hang on. 
I know you guys can't, really can't read this necessarily because it's going to be real, real small, but this is the IPMS events for coming up here. So let me just go through here real fast. April 6th, weekend of April 6th, you have the Phantom Flashers show in Anniston, Alabama. You have the Fast Tracks IPMS Race City Spring Kong 24 in Statesville, North Carolina. You have the IPMS Roscoe Turner Indianapolis Invitational. Uh, that's in Lebanon, Indiana, which is north of Indianapolis. You have 2024 Surgicon in Bondurant, Iowa. You have MosquitoCon in Wayne, New Jersey. For anybody who's in the New Jersey area, that is in the exact same building that the, the NNL East is in, so the police athletic building there, if you want a preview of the venue. Uh, April 7th, so Sunday of that weekend, you have BuffCon, which is in Chicatawaga, which is Buffalo, New York. And you have ValleyCon in Chicopee, Massachusetts. April 13th, you have FleetCon in Monticello, Iowa. Who knew Iowa had so many auto car contests? Uh, <laughs> Motor Classic 2024 in Fairfax, Virginia. Tiger Fest 29 in Medieri, Louisiana, which, of course, is New Orleans area. You have Down East Con in, uh, on the Sunday of that weekend, which is in Sanford, Maine. I know that uh, I think that's one of the ones that Jason the Blue Ox is going to. The following mm. weekend. I, on April 20th, you have Model Con 419 in Perrysburg. So that's Toledo area. There you go. Yeah. There's something yeah. for you to do. Uh, Can Am Con 24 in Williston, Vermont. The Soda City Model Con in Columbia, South Carolina. The Route 66 Model Expo in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Island Showcase 2024 Scale Model Contest and Show in Victoria, British Columbia. That Sunday is Semex, which, by the way, is Southeast Michigan Model Expo. Semex 2024 in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, Detroit area. And the Spring Show IPMS Region 7 Convention in Renton, Washington, Seattle area. The Sunday of that, Flight 19 Gundam Model Show in Lauder Hill, Florida. So there are, in fact, quite a number of things to do in April. If you don't uh, mind there being a couple of filthy boats and planes and tanks on the tables around your precious, precious cars. <laughs> You know, it's funny. People ask me all the time, you know, oh, I missed the show in Detroit. You know, is there a schedule somewhere of all shows coming up? And I don't know that a cent there is a central location for every show. Do you? No, you have some stuff that's posted at like Model Cars Magazine. I know there's a Facebook group page called Model Car Shows, but I don't know who <laughs> runs that and how often it gets updated because it seems to be very sporadic. Um, a lot right. of times stuff gets posted the weekend of the show and it's like, well, I'm telling me now it doesn't do me any good. I need to know this three weeks ago. Um, you know, the IPMS events calendar is there for that stuff, but yeah, I don't know that anyone has figured out. And I think it is a little bit of the fact that it's so disparate. You just have random people putting on shows and there's no, you know, right. IPMS has an organization that, you know, all of those regions have to have a coordinator to make sure that shows don't they don't exist in the same region on the same day so you don't have a show in two places in louisiana on the same day and stuff like that so there's a there's a there's a rhyme and reason for their schedule i just i don't know how you would coordinate that with what goes on you have your big yeah. tent pole events nnl east you know acme nnls although that's going away next year and stuff like that and then you have all these small little shows all over the place i don't know there's any way for Right, you centralize that necessarily. Have you ever been to the uh, David Parsley Customs um, Cincinnati show on May fourth? Have you ever been to that one? I have not. I mean, Cincinnati Neither. for me is a five and a half hour drive. Same. Um, I it, it was. I always used to run the back door of uh, RightCon, which is the Region Four IPMS region in Dayton, and. If I was going to go to a show, I think I'd stop in Dayton before I drove the rest of the another hour and a half down to Cincinnati from there. But yeah, it's it's, it's a good show from what I've heard. It certainly sucked every car modeler out of the IPMS region uh, show. Oh, gotcha. Were, so I mean, yeah, I, was, I will do the May shows. Uh, you know, at the end of April. But yeah. There's, uh, you know, like, you know, William Wagman. They're saying the the Mama Show or Mama Show, the the, the Mid Atlantic NNL that's in May. The the uh, Cincinnati Model Show is in May. The NNL in Minnesota is in May. So there's a, there's a bunch of stuff coming up in in the following month after that. If you, yeah, it's if you're willing to drive, you know, or willing to fly, you could you could go to a show 
every single weekend from from March until June, probably. Yeah, I mean, it, it just glancing, you know, again at the IPMS thing, you had that show in Lauderhill, and then the the following weekend's a show in Melbourne, Florida. So there's like two shows in Florida, two hours apart. Uh, you, you know, Houston, Portland. Uh, it's just it goes on and on and on and on. There's there's really uh, other than uh, you know social anxiety lack of interest or, or whatever <laughs> there's no reason you can't get out of it i mean it's a real thing for a lot of people that it, uh, it is you know, say so you, you i watched your video very brave of you to make that video i think and you. you know not a conversation about that but very brave to come out and say that my wife has the same issue with large crowds and so i'm familiar with the uh the handling of <laughs> the people who are just like get me out of this room i don't want to be in this room but uh yeah I mean, it's, I, a, it's, it's a solitary hobby, and now we're going to throw 300 people in a small gymnasium and go, have fun, guys. <laughs> you know. Right. So I did pretty good in, in Detroit. Um, I did talk to a few people, a few uh, viewers. I don't know that they watch us, but they at least they watch me. But, um, yeah, they, they came up and said hi, and I, I truly made an effort to strike up conversations with anybody that came up next to me and, and talked to me, which, you know, and by the end of the day, I was just like, I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you get for being famous podcaster now. <laughs> right. Famous. Uh, Carl uh, Kadeski here saying, you'd love to go to a show, but not sure what's close to Altoona. Carl, there's um, Pittsburgh shows. I know that's not exactly close to Altoona. I understand that. Um, the next closest thing to that is PenCon, which happens in the beginning of September, and that's in Carlisle. Which again, it's not exactly close to close to Altoona, uh, but you know, it's not that far away either. And then in November, there's a show. Um, John will help me with Brolin. It will help me with his name in the comments. If I know your comments aren't integrated, they're integrated to us, but they may not be integrated to you, depending on whose channel you're watching it right now. But it's, um, I think it's called the Bunker Brawl. It's run by a guy who runs a military first hobby shop up towards Indiana, Pennsylvania. But that's in New Florence, Pennsylvania, which is sort of south of Indiana, a little west of, or a little east of Altoona. That's probably your closest show. And that's usually the second Saturday of November when that show takes place. That might be an option for you. Um, you know, we'll talk. If I can get a flyer for that, we'll throw it up. Um, and just to say, a, I, I, I drove two and a half hours to get to the Columbus show, and I drove three three hours and 15 minutes to go to the Detroit show. So it's, th there's nothing in your backyard. Well, actually there is one here in my backyard, but um, for the most part, you, you just got to get in the car and go. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, oh no, no. I, my, my whole goal in life is to get you out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to go to Toledo, you think? Yeah, yeah, I may go. I don't, know. I don't know. I know that IPMS club has been up there for a while, but they haven't had a show in like forever. So this is their first, first show back in a number of years, at least since COVID. So I'm not sure okay. what, to, what to expect there, but it should be a good time. And it's only two hours us. away. Yeah. I was saying that'll bring us to everyone's favorite thing. Let's talk about what we're going to buy this month. Now, um, this is an especially box art light <laughs> version of this because there's so much of this stuff that doesn't have box art. But it is, I think, fun because Mr. Uh, Tester and I were just having a conversation the other day about the fun uh, nature of Fujimi's uh, releases lately. And this is, is this, 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 <laughs> this month is no exception. I love this part. <laughs> so... <laughs> We'll start on the domestic side of things. Guys, I don't know specifically of any Revell kits coming out. We just had those five dump at the beginning of this month, the Jeep and all that stuff. So I don't know if anything else is coming out. I know that the I've seen box art now for the 78 Chevy pickup truck, that god-awful custom weird thing that was done in the hot rod boxing and stuff like that. Yeah, several. Uh, Brian has one too. And, uh, yeah, so that that's coming sooner than later. Hey, Wenbin. And... Yeah, so take that for what it's worth, I guess. We have, over at AMT, some doozers this month, I guess. A couple of these aren't too bad, but some of them are like yikes. 
my I, and this is something I, I I showed James as soon as the box art was released for because I said this is something you need. I, I you need a seventy nine Chevy Nova because if there was ever a kit that screamed the especially the stuff you're into right now, it's this right here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a two-in-one. You got stock, you got street machine. There's a certain part of me that that because this is around the the time I was born and these malaise era kits, like I will I will go and I will be the first person in line at Betker's place to buy a Chevette just because that's such a <laughs> god awful car. They made a model kit of it. They actually made two model kits of that, two different generations. One was with the round headlights, and one with the square headlights. So this last was seen as the squad rod. So it's not that far away, but it is now sort of in a more sedate packaging, I guess. I, from what I've seen, the MPC Nova of the two, yes, that's right, AMT made a Nova too. This is the better of the two. Um, I'm not sure what that's saying necessarily in the given nature of GM's cars in the late 1970s. In the real cars, not the model kit. But yeah, so that's 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 a thing. Does that one have separate fenders? Which version was no, that? that was had the, the separate that was fenders. Like the, the set for Fenders one was like the '72 Nova. The old it was an old, and it was that had a that had a name to it for the longest time because oh, the, the front end, awful. the front fenders were separate because there was a Pontiac version of that kit too, and the, they didn't fit. It was bad. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that that that's a thing. And then while we're on the things, this is certainly a thing. I wish they would. I kind of wish they'd restore this to its original status. I know there are a couple more parts in this this time around that make it a little more stocky than it was the last time. But <laughs> oh, who doesn't need a '73 Mercury Cougar Street Machine? Oh, from what I've seen, this actually has a flat hood and the stock exhaust in it. Hmm. So you're not quite so street machiney. I Look at the side pipes. <laughs> the the well known I built every model kit in in five minutes guy just did the video on this. <laughs> Even with the, the stock rims, the tires stick out from the fender, so I don't think there's anything that, that I I assume that's the way the kit is not builder error in that. But um, oh. I think this is the first time this kit has been available since this boxing in the early 1980s. Now that may say something about why we haven't reproduced this kit in the last 35. 37 years but yeah that, that's that's a thing that's on gonna be on sale uh we're also gonna get and this is the nice uh box art which uh, frankly looks like we're on an acid trip here but the uh this is a 72 corvette convertible this is a, a mueller era kit this is a 90s era amt kit it's the second version of the 70 70 zr1 corvette right. so this is actually a very nice kit if you're into that era of corvettes uh, all joking about the box art aside. Um, but again, I don't think this has been reissued since the 2000s, like 20 years ago, 2000s. So it's... Uh, I wish that I had a picture of Steve's build of that that kit, because it's beautiful. He did a beautiful job of of making that into something nice. He, he really polished one <laughs> to, to, uh, to make that kit look good. Um, I, I don't know about that one, man. It's that's rough. Carl, I'm going to grab Carl's here because uh, Carl also answered. The it's the old pro. pro. Old pro yeah. is what that was called. Frank also saying the two the two Nova choices are uh, like saying it's the better of two prostate exams. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to argue with it, Frank. Not going to argue. And then uh, also on the reissue slate this month is the 39 Ford Tudor sedan. So aside from the fact that you wanted to collect the box art of the 1978 release of this kit, um, as far as I know, the 39 parts, because I asked this question because I honestly didn't know because one of the guys was the last time I would have bought one of these, was the 39 parts have been in the 40 sedan forever. So the one that was just reissued in the original art series, the, the Gasser, had all the 39 parts in it. So I think it's been right. seven years since the kit was around last. Um, yeah, so, I mean... I know that every single person on YouTube who was involved in the uh, inaugural You Suck uh, committee build <laughs> uh, had to endure this kit. So, yeah, take take that for what it's worth. Or or I had the option of enduring this kit. A lot of people built the 40 coupe. But, yeah, this was the other 
side of that thing. Right. I mean, is it the only Tudor sedan version there is? Yeah, but again, two 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 options of prostate exams. <laughs> that's that. That's a rough kit. It's just it's just showing its age at this point. It's just. But you know that the old guys. I'm going to say the old guys, but you know that the. the people who grew up building model cars in the 60s that's what they remember that's what makes them happy so i i get it i i built one as a kid like i can honestly say that as a kid that came out the the one that you built i think or the some of the one that has the 90s graphics and the god awful billet wheels right. i built that kit as a kid because i didn't know any better i was 13 years old and it's a new kit yay no it's not but uh like <laughs> i have i have different like different feelings about different old amt kits because like i hate that kit but the 49 mercury which is equally as old i built that for my dad and i love that kit that's actually for what it is a really nice model kit and you can really make it and it's not artificially chopped like the revel one that was done 20 years later but right at any rate that's that's the thing that uh, exists out there for you and so on to the salvino jr festival that is nascar every which way you can stand it uh, the the club kit, if you will, the one that everybody in the cl- in, in the voters club will get, the vintage kit this month, is this Tim Richmond '86 Monte Carlo. I had mentioned, I think, if anybody watched the last stash, the the April kit, the March kit release video I did this week, I said that cow petty car should smell like cigarettes and mold because it's just so old. This is another <laughs> one that when you open it up should just smell like old model kit because monogram did this back in 1986 mm. they didn't do this specific car the decals are slightly different this is a bristol raceway car i don't know what car the one that uh, that monogram did back in 86 you'll have cartograph decals you'll have the actually the number of 25s in the monograms are like a weird font and a weird shape they're not accurate to the car but uh it's buildable yeah, now I mean, I mean, I mean, it's an old monogram kit. You know what you're going to get an old monogram NASCAR kit because chances are you've built this or a version of it somewhere in the past. I'll get one right. just be, being part of the Builders Club. So uh, I will be, again, disappointed when I open it that it doesn't smell like somebody's, like, dog. But, <laughs> I, I, I mean, Tim Richmond's one of those really interesting stories. Uh, this was his best year. He finished third in points in 1986. Obviously, he passed away of... AIDS in 88, beginning in 88 uh, season. And there's a whole like background story where he was sick. NASCAR knew it. They faked a drug test to throw him out of NASCAR in 1987. He eventually proved that he wasn't on, wasn't taking narcotics and was reinstated, but nobody would give him a ride. And then he died about six months later. So, I mean, it was, it's really, he was a really promising driver. There's a lot of the things about days of thunder, Tom Cruise's character was based on Tim Richmond's sort of persona. So like a, just a character in real life. And so it's an interesting uh, car in that nature. Uh, they're also going to be doing with the official box art here, the William Byron's Daytona car from this year. So this is the car that just won the Daytona 500 back in February. And I don't have a box art for it. It did exist at one point in time, but then for some reason it went away, I think because it's not the official box art, but they're also going to be doing the, kit for kyle larson that is his coca-cola 600 car and it's a little bit i know we're splitting nits here about liveries but it's a little bit different than the normal hendrick car that he's been running this year uh he is going to pull the iron man double as it's kind of colloquially unknown he's going to run the indy 500 and then assuming there's no weather, going to fly from Indy to Charlotte and run the, the Coca-Cola 600. So he's going to try the 1,100 mile uh, circuit on Memorial Day weekend this year. He's driving yeah. a, a McLaren owned their Chevy power because of the fact that IndyCar now is a spec car the way NASCAR is. But so he's going to be driving for McLaren, McLaren orange. You see a little bit of that in this livery. And okay. the, the IndyCar and this car look the same. So they're sort of sharing a livery for... Uh, the race, so yeah, I mean, if you're a Kyle Larson fan, which there are a good deal of, he did win a race already this year. Uh, that's that's something else for you folks to consider. That, like I said, is pretty much the domestic kits this month, unless somebody releases something that and it ends up coming popping up. Um, let's see, so you I said Shizuka, Shizuka's coming up in May, Shizuka's coming up in May. The next time we meet, which will be April the 8th, pending 
catastrophes, disasters, and floods. Uh, we may have, and I don't know what day Hasegawa's going to do, but we may have Hasegawa stuff for the show because the models will get put up for pre-order before the show because the whole, right. you know, nine, the whole 90 days prior to sale kind of thing. So next time we meet, we may have a lot to talk about in terms of the Shizuka show. And then the actual show is the first weekend of May. So once May rolls around, we'll, you know, we'll reconvene with all the pictures from the show and we'll talk about stuff we already knew about, which is kind of unfortunate, but you know, yeah. we'll have you know the, 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 the build stuff, but yeah, Shizuka, Shizuka is coming up here in about a month and this next go around of Hasegawa releases will be for the summer. So it just matters to be seen if they're going to do it in time. And Tim says if, if Tania designed a <laughs> Chevelle altered wheelbase, so maybe it's Shizuka. We'll, we'll announce that. <laughs> Shizuka should be interesting this year because Tamiya didn't do any car stuff this spring at right. the uh, Nuremberg Toy Fair. They just had that clear version of the, the Mercedes Gullwing and a couple of reissues. That Fiat, right. Yeah, so it'd be nice to see if there's anything from Tamiya at the show in terms of like another kit coming this summer. We're going to have to wait until the All Japan in October. Um, but they're Hasegawa, real good about they're real good about, you know, oh, we're going to make a new kit. It'll be out next month. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're to me a very, very hush hush secret secret. But uh, the, what I was going to say is Hasegawa, I would expect we're going to get another version of that 90s, 80, late 80s, early 90s, 300ZX, because it's been yeah. a year since that came out. So there'll be a, ma I would assume, a major uh, retool, something. The, the late version. Uh, you know, something like that was the early version. So, I assume the late version with a different front bumper will probably be what it is. Um, right. yeah, arguments. To, I'm sorry, I was reading a comment there. Uh, so over at Aoshima, Aoshima, two well, three, three kits this month. One we were just discussing here a few seconds ago in its stock version, and that, of course, is the new. Yay! DeLorean time I'm buying machine. it. I'm buying both the this time machine and the stock car. I have a personal thing where I don't build movie cars just because I like the movie and I don't want to ruin it, right? <laughs> this, as we talked about, guys, everything you see that's on the outside of this car, remember we just showed you a flyer of the stocker version. It's the same body. This is, right. all of that stuff is separate. This kit has somewhere approaching 180 pieces from what I remember from the original literature. So all of this stuff, I realize my mouse burns on my screen, all of this stuff, all of these wires and this bun, all this wiring bundle and all this goofy stuff and the the rear, you know, engine compartment type stuff here. I'm assuming they don't have a Mr. Fusion to build it the other way because this kit will, uh, like I said, with the gullwing doors open, everything on here, everything in the interior, like the little read out that we set the 19 and all yeah. that yeah you know, that's all <laughs> separate like it's very stock car to begin with within the concept of the movie but it's going to come with these little wide these little flaming uh acrylic <laughs> things for tires it does come with the big hook to hook the clock tower uh at yeah. the end of the movie so uh you know a lot of a lot of thought went into this it's not just a spit out like reissue of the of the kits that's been out since the 90s that they sort of tossed a couple extra parts into Completely right. new tool. Uh, the stock version is going to have a stock engine in it, so I assume this will have most of that stock engine with, of course, the, the fusion parts for the top. And, uh, yeah, super cool if you're into the movie. I, right. I, I would assume that we will see this over the course of 25 and 26 come out as the, the other car in the, yeah. the second version and the third version with the railroad wheels. Um, the third version of the existing kit came with a railroad track base that you can put it on. I assume that would be will make a second uh, appearance as well. But yeah, having a new tool with DeLorean, it's been 30 years since the original kit was tooled up, which has always been an argument of mine. We're like, well, why don't we ever retool this? So oh, there's one that exists. It's fine. Is it right. though? Uh, another version of the Liberty Walk of Vendador. This one just came out, I don't know, three months ago. The only difference between this one and the other one is this one's going to be molded in mint green. Uh Otherwise, it's the exact same. The twenty. This is the car that celebrates the twenty-fifth anniversary of Liberty Walk and the fiftieth birthday of the owner of Liberty Walk. Uh, again, there's another version of this. It's molded in some other color. I can't remember. I think it's silver. 
I have it, but it's not in front of me to look at. And yeah, I mean, if you like the Liberty Walk cars, it's certainly something. I do. I, I really do. Um, when I just going to Japan, all the times that I've gone and, and gone to the Liberty Walk store, I, I, I get it. You know, that's that's just neat to me. So, yeah, I get it. Will I buy six of them? No, no. Just say, be fine. I, I know it's not, er not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, you know, you could build a 64 gas or, you know, station wagon noble. Why would you build that? But, uh, <laughs> but again, wait a minute, guys, wait a minute, guys, if you're wait a minute. Tim, Tim says he's going to build a Liberty walk time machine. <laughs> Don't put a path that guy. Don't be least Liberty walk. Everything you can think of. I, I, if he had a, he had access to DeLorean and a fender saw, he'd probably put over fenders on it. I, I kid you not. Uh, so the last thing here is this, Toyota Celsius. Again, I know this is not everybody's wheelhouse here, but we talk about everything. If you haven't figured this out, we talk about every kit. We're not just American here. Uh, interesting here is this is sort of the would be the Lexus 430. Um, we'll not have the Lexus parts, I wouldn't imagine. But the last time this particular version of this kit was available was 1989. It's been released one time uh, wow. in this up, uh, slightly upgraded front fascia version. It's, again, splitting nits, and I know nobody cares, but it's kind of fun for that because it's just like, where's that tooling been hiding all of this time? <clears throat> so let's do, <laughs> which I think is going to become over the months because we only talk about the kits that are coming in the next month. I already know the kits are coming for like the next three months. We just don't go into that because it would be too much to keep track of. Right. And this is going to become Mr. Tester's favorite part of this whole podcast is this. Let's talk about the, let's talk about the Fujimi kits this month. So, <laughs> This one, I don't think, is necessarily a bad one because I know that Mr. Chester just bought one of these not too terribly long ago. This is the reissue of the 112 scale uh, GTR in the Calisonic livery. You just bought one of these that had two of them in a box. So uh, I guess if you need new decals, you know, <laughs> I don't think you should buy the whole kit to get new decals, but if you wanted to source mm -hmm. decals, they would exist. Um, these are basically really big, almost plastic die cast like they're held together with screws the body is yes. made out of AMF plastic so it's not traditional styrene right. uh but traditional styrene gets a little wonky when the all the doors and panels open uh in the scale so it's made out of something a little heftier uh the race car version is a race car version this is like i said the, of the all the things i'm going to show you out of fujimi this is the least fujimi of them all um these are still pretty pricey they're in like the buck 25 range uh yeah, i thought they were like 200 cars. And let me see. Well, let's say they're they're somewhere in the they're definitely open. Let me see if I can find a version. Let's see. But they're they're nice kits, and you know, I um I was lucky enough to get a a, a guy in our club passed, and he was an avid collector of those 12 scale uh Nissan GTRs. And so I had built one years ago stock. And I, I came across another box, which I thought was just another kit. But when I opened the box, there was two of them in it. So I have two more GTRs to build. And I was looking online in Colts 3D, and there's lots of speed parts that I can buy, you know, for five, ten bucks. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a, a drift car or something out of one of them. Um. That's a good point because the, especially the stock version of this leaves a little bit to be desired in detail terms. It's almost like they blew the 124 scale one up, even though the 124 right. scale one doesn't have an engine. So a lot of those additional parts can really make this stand out. Looking at the price of the last one of these they did, which is the HKS one, was with the exchange rate is 156.96. So it's not like it's a little higher than I said, but it's not okay, it's not quite right. 100 bucks. Um, so so the next thing. <laughs> Oh god, why do they do this to me? It's, it's this Mitsubishi Evo 7 rally car. Hey, okay. it's Tommy Mc, it's Tommy Mackinnon's car. He won the championship that year. To me, it did a version of this kit. Okay. What's the problem here? Well, guys, Fujimi never made a rally kit. Ever. <laughs> so what this, here it is, comes. <laughs> what this is is an Evo 7 streetcar with some decals tossed on it. <laughs> Show me a roll cage. I'll wait. 
<laughs> yeah, you're right. There isn't one. This is a street car. Um, it's got treaded tires. It's, I mean, all in all, is this a bad Evo 7? No. Is Fujimi's better? Uh, to me, is better, even though it has metal axles? Yes. Um, the big problem with Fujimi's Evos is the fact that they are, um, these two parts, the trees up here at the top, have been in this kit since the Evo 3. They're the Evo 3 chassis. This is the Evo 3 dashboard. This is the Evo 3 suspension and the Evo 3 seats, and the Evo 3 steering wheels, and everything. And down here, molded in red, is the Evo 7 dashboard, and the Evo 7 wing struts, and the Evo 7 exhaust, and the wipers, and all the parts that make it, you know, 10 years newer. So, like so many Fujimi kits that exist, this is an old kit with some new parts thrown in it. Now, granted, these new parts were thrown in it back when this car was new, back in the 90s. So this is an old car, you know, it still manages to carry a metal axle, because why not? I just don't understand the point of this. This is something that didn't exist in the catalog previously. Why exactly it is we decided it in 2024, the thing that we needed was a rally version homage car. Because it's just like, yeah, I had an Evo 7. You know what I decided to do? I make a rally car out of it. And then I drove it around the shows. I'm like, look at my quasi rally car. Because it's effectively what that ends up being. Uh, so this, <clears throat> this, this thing, is, oh wait a minute yeah go go ahead th this is a 1986 nissan 300 zx so it's the what third gen zx um to me of course has a much better version of this kit that exists this <laughs> my friends out there watching has oh yeah it's the high society kit here are your sticks of chewing gum that you're gonna have to cut <laughs> into the shape of the door openings if you watch the last video we talked about the the uh bubble gum the, yeah the bubble gum so yeah this is atrocious i mean this i don't know even know what the hell is this, this <laughs> chassis is that's worse I than mean, a johan <laughs> this this stuff over here because i showed one of these things to, to james the other day and he was what the hell is this this is the battery carrier right two double a's <laughs> going here um this is the this is the front suspension which is designed to have one of those uh goofy things that you know when it backed up it turned right and when it went straight it went straight kind of things <laughs> this right here is the motor carrier that goes back here that would carry the electric motor to spin these rear wheels and um this is a generic chassis tree that goes to this generic chassis this is not specific to this kit it's under a lot of fujimi kits from the 1980s hence why there's just some random seats and some random mirrors and two tongue depressor things to hold the the, the front suspension together and all of these donuts here to size the suspension to be the correct height for the car and uh, it's just a random effing steering wheel and a couple of antennas and over here is the actual interior to the 300 zx you notice it does have a left-hand drive dash and left-hand drive wipers and stuff so i mean i guess if you didn't care what was underneath your car it's there this interior i don't know what this goes to because this is obviously the hatchback part of the car these two right. things being separate pieces I don't know if this was originally something and then they added this part of the tree on top afterwards, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's Ooh. there. It's, it's got my favorite things in all the world, the rivets that you pound into the front suspension. <laughs> it even shows you in the instructions with a hammer. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah that's what a best part of Fujimi instructions. Here's a hammer. Beat the <laughs> crap out of your model kit. Mm -hmm. Guys, if you want to, you want this gen 300 ZX to me, it was reissued theirs back when the, the, current new quote-unquote 400 zx came out it's still widely available skip this unless you really want some bubble gum because <laughs> yeah i mean I, I, I don't understand i just don't Back um while we were talking about cars that aren't what they're supposed to be this is supposed to be a drift s13 sylvia but it is a stock car with decals that's all it is This will be the last Fujimi kit. This one, really not that bad. It's just an interesting uh, idea. So I know this doesn't look like anything from the from the roof down here, but what this is is a Nissan March K11, which is the second-gen Nissan March. And this will be the Nismo version because, hey, zoom, zoom. <laughs> zoom, zoom. Up, it's a K, isn't it? Huh? Isn't that a K car? 
And uh, no, it's slightly larger than a K car. It's like a K plus. Okay. It's it's the next level up. Now this tool, this kit was tooled in like 1993 or so, so it's new, right? Like, this is a halfway decent looking chassis and stuff like that. I don't know if this is a left hand drive, right hand drive dashboard, or if it's two different styles of dashboard. It's really hard to tell whether or not like this. I think yeah. this turn the head sideways. Yeah, I, I think the steering wheel plugs in there, but um. Because like the the second version, they did a newer Nissan March uh, as well. It only comes in right hand drive. So I don't know if this this car was sold in England. I know that in the UK, but again, that would be right hand drive in the UK. It's not a bad kit. I wish there was something I could show you of this that was you know actual box art, but I can't find a kit boxing of this. The, all of the ones are, are the, the newer one, right? right. Um, yeah, but like, yeah, it's it's. It's certainly a conversation piece. I think this right here is what makes it the Nismo, the skirting and the seats and all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly unique. It's it's it's. It would be the only one on the contest table, that's for sure. Yeah, that car is is inline three powered, so <laughs> or transverse transverse three cylinder because it's a front wheel drive car. But yeah, um, one other thing I saw here that's uh, actually I forgot from the round two stuff is a reissue of the Watkins 40 foot trailer. Uh, a lot of people have been wondering where this was, where this was at. Cause it was advertised quite a while ago. So the reefer version of the Fruhoff 40 foot trailer, uh, W925 not included, obviously. So the truck guys, you're getting another kick out of that trailer. And then that'll take us over to the Aoshima stuff, which is not without its issues this month. I will say that. <laughs> I, I I can't. I will. I am a equal opportunity a negative guy in the hobby. <laughs> so first up, you have a reissue of their Volkswagen Type Two Microbus with a roof carrier. Uh, this is something that technically doesn't exist in, in, in a technical sense. I mean, the the Type Two Microbus has been around forever, and this roof carrier exists as well. First time they've sort of thrown it together in the same boxing. You can't go wrong with this. It's curbside. I mean, if you want a full detail one, you buy the Ravello Germany one and enjoy gluing every part of it together because the body's multi-piece. Um, this this Hasegawa kit, it's one piece body. Um, I think the years of the Ravello in Germany and this one are separate as well. So the the roof rack shown here in its glorious 3D CAD is da -da -da, photo etch. So have fun bending all of this together into, into, into this shape. But... Uh, they <laughs> gluing it all together, right? Yeah, and they say get out your get out your uh, get out your not I'm so I want to say welder. What's the, your soldering iron and uh, solder that together? This 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 has been in something else. It had a different like roof mount for the other. It was on, I think one of the Suzuki Jimneys had this attached okay. to the roof, except obviously it had a different roof rack attachment base. But yeah, I mean, not nothing bad there, but it's it's interesting what they do sometimes to make a new kit. Um, reissue the Lancia Stratos HF in the Acropolis Rally version. Um, I can't remember where this... I, I looked all the stuff up the other day as far as like finishing, so I'd be prepared, but then I forgot it all. Uh, yeah, Bic livery, so that's kind of cool. Um, you know, it's it's certainly it's certainly of a time period, right? Of, of yeah, like Bic pens. That was a thing one time. One time, remember Bic lighters, uh, right? Yeah, that too. <laughs> the uh, this is a being a, a gravel rally car has the gravel wheel set in it, which is not in every single Stratus. So that's kind of interesting. It's that they actually of one time that Hasegawa tooled up the correct wheels to something was in those Stratuses. Um, I want to want this car because you know me and Japanese touring. So this right. is a 1993 Intertech, the last race of the 1993 season, uh, an EG6 Civic, obviously. Now. You say, well, it's a Casio Alpine. There's two names from the 90s that no one remembers. But why would you, why are you hesitant about this kit? Well, A, you know I'm building a Civic and I can't finish because everything on it is a Flash monster. <laughs> but the bigger problem I have with this is these, these, you know, Ray's a big sponsor here, Ray's Wheels, right? There is nothing in the Hasegawa catalog across the entire spectrum of their race car kits that has a six spoke chrome flat face front wheel and a four spoke flat faced rear wheel. <laughs> and there is nothing in the literature for this kit that says it's coming with new parts. 
Hmm. So I, I can only presume the worst that these wheels are not going to be the wheels that come in the kit, yeah. which would be, which would to me defeat the entire purpose of this kit because I could just bought a sheet of decals otherwise, even though nobody's ever done this decal sheet before. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, 3D printing being what it is, if, if they don't, it doesn't yeah. say parts different than the kit, than the picture. But it also doesn't say they're new parts, so I'm I'm very hesitant. I have pre-ordered it because JPT has to have all the it. things, right? But <laughs> oh, I I don't know. I'm I'm desperately worried that this is going to be a a mediocre Honda and and made ten times more mediocre by not having the right crap on it. Which this was this is very specific to this car too. Like this weird wheel setup isn't in other Civics, which is why those wheels would have to be made. So I. I, that may be one of those things where it pops up on hobby search and then I cancel my HLJ order the next minute afterwards because, like, I don't need this. <laughs> right. Um, right. Mazda 677, 667, or 767B. Wow, can't talk. 89 Daytona 24 hour race, fifth place finisher overall. So, not a bad result. This will get um, a bunch of the 3D printed part treatment that is we've been seeing in Hasegawa kits recently. Yeah. Your mirrors are going to be 3D printed. Your whole rear wing and the winglets and all that is going to be 3D printed. Uh, these little things, I'll get my pointers on the wrong screen. These little things here, which are the engine intakes, these are 3D printed. Um, if there's something else about this 3D printed, it still says that the parts don't match the kit, which I guess probably means the wheels are wrong or maybe this or something else. This is a slightly different spec car than the 767 that ran at IMSA or at, ran at Le Mans and then ran later in. Uh, the Japanese sports car prototype series, but it's right. an interesting conversation piece. It's an American car for you guys to complain that no, the Japanese companies don't make American stuff. Well, there, there's a 24 hours of Daytona car that's technically American. Then you have this. You're gonna love this because this is something right up your right up your alley. This is this this again. This is our James Tester special right here. Remember the was one. So for the 40th anniversary of the Yoko Dishu <laughs> Make Doc anime. They are releasing a Subaru 360 attached to the uh, series. Come on, you need a pink 360, just <laughs> like everybody else does. I bought this Honda uh, Toyota S800. Yeah, I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah, this is, the, this is the titular lead car of the original anime. And what's different about this, you might ask, this giant red nonsense on the front here, the, the Yoko Dishu <laughs> Megadoc logo. Yeah, that's it. That's all this different. Plus, I think it's molded in pink. So that's that's literally your differences to this kit. But hey, it's the 40th anniversary of the series. So, yay! I'll buy it. Because <laughs> it's um, small and it's Japanese. That's why. I... The the thing that I'm looking forward to, the, the, the coup de grace of, of Hasegawa's nonsense this month is the liftback version of this of this new celica Ooh, we talked about this one yeah yes so for the folks who missed previous podcasts the chassis running gear of this including the the uh the glorious because every, every car needs a set out of japan wantanabe wheels there are the parts out of the current sedan or not sorry the coupe version of the celica that kit's been around since 1994 so that's where the the origin of or no excuse me 2004 so that's where the origin of this the, the chassis of this is the entire body and all of the accoutrement thereof and the interior because it's an interior that's specific to the the hatchback are brand new tooling that they are just doing this week or this week well this month so you're going to get the a, a very cool i've been wanting one of these for a while um it's we stole the Mustang. Stole the whole ass end of the whole oh, Mustang, exactly. So <laughs> this was a time period in Japanese cars in general where a lot of the design studios were sending their lead designers to US design schools. And when they came back to Japan, a lot of those muscle car influences were seen in those cars. So yeah, you got a Coke bottle body here. You clearly got a you know, short deck, long hood, you know, muscle car look to the car. The Gallant is the same way. The the other 70s era uh, sports cars of, of Japan were the same way. And then, this, like I said, this whole back end of it clearly stolen off a Mustang. And like I said, it's got a whole new interior for it. I, would, I don't know that this dashboard 
is new or not because like the coupe version has left hand drive and left hand drive wipers. It would be super awesome if they left that alone and you know made it so you could take these pedals and move them over and, and all that stuff. But if not, it's it's you know right hand drive. And then you know, I'm assuming that this is decals, these little rivets in here. This the branding this, irons. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know if this I don't know if this is painted a different color or if this is actually decals. The decals are certainly will be the, the little rivets, and then there's uh yeah, so it's like I said, it's a whole new this is a side pan these side panels are separate, so this is a platform style interior, so it's a nice new interior, it's not the uh, a bathtub slash margarine container kind of interior. So that's cool. Something I wanted for a while because while the Aoshima one is a newer version, it's like a 77 and that's 72, so there's differences in the hood and grills and stuff like that. I've wanted a good Celica lift back, hatchback, however you want to talk about that uh, for a long time now. That's something that's been needed. The Aoshima kit is an IMA tool from the 80s, so it's even older than old. And a lot of those IMA kits aren't necessarily 124 scale, so. Eh. Right. And being a new Hasegawa kit, that is going to be a piece of cake and it will fit together and you won't be scraping mold lines. And yeah, it'll be beautiful. Exactly. Easy. Two last things. We have this just got released in Hong Kong, so it'll probably end up being like June and in the rest of the world. But and I know nobody, not too many people necessarily care, but the Brabham. 83 Monaco GP uh, kit. This was a, something that BMAX did a while ago, much like the McLaren we talked about a few shows ago. This was the situation where they lost the ability to use the BMAX name because of the whole Aoshima distribution thing. And so this kit hasn't been available in like eight or nine years now. So just a reissue, but something that, again, has been out of stock. Good luck finding one for a while. And also, we can grab this real quick i wish there was a way to like stack multiple screen shares so that i could go through them quicker but it is what it is folks bear with me the and this is a whoops oh, 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 picture you that ah, one. all right talked about those i'll talk about them again this is a reissue technically speaking of the new new audi r8 lms this is the 2022 version so the wing back here has been flipped around I know nobody cares, but I do. I had to buy that. I had to buy a resin piece to get the right wing. Right, exactly. Project. So the Audi R8 in the 2015 has a sl is a slightly different body. The tw in 2020 they did the Evo, which has the wing still hanging off the back here, and then in 2021 we went to the Evo 2 spec, which has the Swan neck spoiler where it's hanging in front of the. Uh, support again. I'm sure I'm moving my mouse around, but you guys can't see it. So this used to this used to hang off the back like a traditional GT3 car. Now it's got this uh, swan neck where the spoiler sits in front of the brace, and yeah, I mean it's got these are basically a reprint of Frankie's decals. He, this this sheet already exists uh, as tends to be a new new thing. <laughs> they reissue kits. They're like, hey Frank, let me have your decal sheet. Uh, this still technically doesn't have the right grill, or the right headlights for 2022, but those parts exist out there if you're desperate enough to have it match exactly. Right. But right. it's an interesting kit, only from the aspect personally, that you can buy it in Hong Kong, it exists, but you can't even pre order it in Japan. Hmm. There was that whole kerfuffle where New New wanted to raise the prices on a bunch of model kits, and then a lot of us who had ordered, you know, pre ordered. In some cases, a year and a half in advance at that point, those kits and all of our orders got canceled because they, they instead of just raising the price, they went like, ah, oh, no, these kits don't exist anymore. And a crap storm existed over a weekend where, like, new news out of business, they canceled all their orders. And it was just like, no, they needed to raise the prices after COVID because the price of everything, of course, you know, went up. That for some reason has never been added to the pre orders, and now it's out, and they're still not taking pre orders on it. So, yeah, Hong Kong, go order it there because I don't know how else you'll get one. Right, right. Um, we got a couple questions. I don't know the answer to this one. Where's my mouse? Um, Mr. One says, can anybody answer this? What was the first kit with decals included? I don't, I have no idea. James? I mean, so many of those 50s and 60s kits might have had like license plates or 
Okay. You know, so those drag racing cars would have had sponsored decals. I mean, we've all seen like those old 60s AMT kits where, you know, you had like champion spark plug logos and stuff like that that were oh, right, decals, right, but right. they weren't like a decal scheme. I would think right. you'd probably be into the late 60s or so before. Or, well, yeah, late 60s before you'd have decal sheets being an integrated part of a model. Specifically for a model, yeah. Yeah. So much, so much of those early things would have been, you know, old toys. They would have been promos that turned into kits and things like that in the early days. Right. And your your promo isn't gonna, your friction promo isn't going to have decals in it. Right. Um, Jeff had a good question. Um, you can answer this one because I know you probably have ten of them. Any opinions on new new Chevy Cruze kit? <laughs> yeah. Um. It was their first 124 scale kit. So it's a little rough around the edges compared to the other stuff. Uh, one thing to look out for, although if you buy the newer one, the one that has a red and white car on the box art, I don't think it has the same problem. If you buy one of the original Chevy logoed ones, they had an issue where the front end came out of the mold wider than the body is. So you have to like mm. tack one side on and then tack the other side on and massage it to fit. I have 11 of them. Some of them have the problem, some of them don't. So it seems to be like how long the, the trees were in the machine for in some cases as to whether or not they're warped. You can make it fit. Like I said, otherwise, it's a pretty basic kit. I think it's 70 parts or so. Um, I would buy the newer one if you can find one. The it has, Like I said, it has a Mac I think it's 2012 or 2013 Macau Grand Prix box art, and it's a red car with or a white car with some red, red accents to it. Um, that would be the newest version. Um, that would more, most likely not have the problems of the first one. Those decals are abject awful in that kit. First kit, first set of de first you know set of decals. So they're 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 yeah. The hmm. the kit and the kits now use what whoever Frankie's using for their processing. So the decals are awesome now. But in 2012 when that kit came out, they were I don't know who they were. They were uh, from the the decal company of Crack and Crumble Incorporated. Let's put it that way. <laughs> if if you were to suggest if somebody didn't own a single new new kit, which kit would you suggest they buy? Like that's a trick question. Like, what are you into? They do rally, well, yeah. they do touring yeah. cars, they do GT three cars. Like you know, right? I they're all more or less the same quality wise. Like if you've built if you built something that is Aoshima they have that flavor because of that early technical agreement that they went into where Aoshima was like, Oh, okay. When we talked about in the million dollar or the billion dollar question, like that technical expertise of how to make a model kit. So they're tooled up right. like Aoshima kits. They assemble like Aoshima kits. If you sat some, especially the early BMX and, and, and new, new kits together and you sat them beside a race car version, like the, the GT one Lamborghinis, they're going to look the same. Like you're going to be like, well, the same guy designed these kits. I can tell that they are, you know, if you right. get some of those Mueller era AMT kits and you compare them to the Hudson's and the Chrysler 3 and C from Mobius, you could tell John Mueller designed these kits. They break down the same way in the same fashion. Right. So that's really, that ends up being a, what do you want to build? There's so much at this point, we're 40 some odd kits into the, the, the overall scheme of things. So, okay. I think they're all about equally as good. The, okay. the earlier it is, the rougher it's going to be because they were a brand new company and brand new kits. Yeah. Stuff Looking up, days. I think I, I I don't have too many. Maybe four. Maybe four new new kits. Um, yeah, that, so I guess the, the guys out there answered his question. Yeah, it's like 1958. That. Okay, that's earlier than I would have thought. Yeah. Hmm. Though I think you would have like stickers or dry transfers or things like that would have been easier. I mean, decal technology certainly come quite a while in the quite a way in the even since yeah. we you know came into it in in the eighties or so. Right. I'm trying to see if there's anything. This, eh, I would say. Uh, Carl for the 69 Dodge Charger NASCAR, not a generic one. Possibility exists. It, it'll probably be a couple of years. I'm trying to think what I can say without getting in trouble for it. Um, there is, the guys Salvinos are currently 
pursuing licensing that would make it possible. Let's put it that way. They have licenses from Stellantis to make stuff. That's not the problem. It's, the, it's you have to, with race cars, you have to have the, the permission of the guy that owned the company, the guy that drove the car, the, the sponsors that were on the car. And those, and you start talking about stuff from 1969, you're dealing with families of the guy who owned the car, the families of the guy who drove the car. The sponsors don't exist anymore. If they do, who owns the company that, you know, was the company that was around in 1969. So there's, there's a bunch of dancing. So one driver for Dodge that was the primary driver. If you're in your NASCAR, you know who that is. Again, I'm trying to not get into trouble blowing a spot right. there, but um, if they can license the family for that and then get the sponsor for it, then there's a possibility of that. I don't think it's no secret that they're doing a Superbird. That'll be the next new tool that the Salvinos does is a 70 Superbird for Petty. Um, right. They've talked about that in the past. I think they just talked about it this past Saturday general show that's on for everybody on Facebook. So Daytona Charger, they're always like, well, Ravel did one. You know, there's a, the monogram kit of it, and then they sort of made a generic NASCAR version in the Ravel kit as well. But don't give up hope on that, but don't expect it like, you know, this year, I would say. Uh, let's see if there's anything. <laughs> Liberty Walk F85 Streaker. Yeah, sure. Liberty Walk. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I know he's gonna do it. <laughs> I had to replace ninety percent of my Johan Maverick. That's model building. Yeah, I yeah. mean, hey, you know, if, if if the rumors hold true about this things going on over Mobius, you don't have to worry about that again. <laughs> oh, that's right. They are coming out with a. Is it a comet or a Maverick? I think it's a comet. But okay, all right. <laughs> photo etch roof rack frank i'll take the mpc nova thank you very much Off you, <laughs> frank. We're just, we're just of adventure. Uh, let's see pink car comes with a full start and, I'm, <laughs> and the muffler is optional and, <laughs> now, that's know, not it, a that's not a new tool though is that that's no, probably that, 90s that's been around since the nine, yeah that's super 360 has been around since about the 90s or so uh, so maybe i'll just get I'll just buy your old one when you buy the pink one. <laughs> oh, I'm not buying that pink one. I'll, I have, I think I sold, um, sold one of my 360s. I still have one. It's just one of those things where, like, they make a 360 and they make a 360 SS, which was the sporty version of that. I think the difference was five horsepower and a stripe. <laughs> and I was like, I'm never gonna build both of these. Like, who am I trying to get here? Which one had the the opening roof, like a roll top roof? Or did they all that's just like a that, that's not like it's in own individual version. There's one because uh, all of them have the closed roof except the one that has the, the convertible top. I'll have to get the convertible top one. Let's say Jeff Garlison are saying the stock version of the Comet somewhere down the road. I think it's supposed to be. I think you're supposed to do a stock and a drag racing version of that Comet. I think that's what the plan is. Now, when that'll be, Mobius, you know, and it's Pegasus, Pegasus ownership is moves at the speed of cash so uh you know they sell things before they make new things right right they're paying they're for still in there's there's they say we're still we're still waiting on that ford tow truck at this point still waiting on another ford truck there's uh a couple of plymouths that are still in the offing that they've talked about there's an alter wheelbase one and a stock sort of day two version of the dodge so there's quite a bit of things that are known did, quantities that exist, did, you know. We did see the altered wheelbase Dodge at the Columbus show. Sean brought it. Yeah. Is that that should be the, well, I don't know if the tow truck will be the next thing or that old wheelbase Dodge will be the next thing. I think, the, isn't that old wheelbase Dodge a, a, a technically a model king kit, though? I don't know. I don't That's know. That. I don't know if it is or not. It wouldn't necessarily matter in the order of things, but those are the, the two things that should be next. Right. What, ne right. what next means is anybody's guess with them because they don't put <laughs> out a release schedule anymore. And they've sort of, uh, you know, gone a little under the radar with the new ownership. They're not as out there as they used to be when, when Winspur owned it and was active on the forums and promoting his own products. So, right. It is what it is. I mean, I'll grab a tow truck for sure. The other, the other Ford truck, I don't know. It's, I think it might be a bit too MAGA from my taste, but the, the hillbilly one, <laughs> yeah, 
that 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 day two one might be a bit much. I've seen it. It's you know nothing wrong with it, but it's just I have at this point fourteen Mobius Ford trucks. I don't know if I need fifteen, right? So. <laughs> eh, it is what it is. Um, the one thing that was in the back of my mind that I it came up on my channel the other day uh, was. A gentleman from Germany saying that I think he was actually on here, isn't he? I think he was making comments. Maybe not. No, I guess not. Anyway, it was making comments to the effect of not understanding why Ravel kits in in Europe were so much cheaper than Round Two and subbing the JR stuff. And I was pointing out this fact that well, Ravel's now owned by German ownership, so they're able to right. import the U.S. kits to themselves directly, not pay a middleman to import the kits and so therefore the kits are cheaper and and except for a small period of time what like i think it was 2006 through 2012 or so revel of germany rel ag revel gmbh whatever they want to call themselves depending on the organization of the corporation had been owned by revel like the u.s revel owned them for a while and then they became a separate company and then Habico bought them back and they were underneath you know revel in the Havico days until the bankruptcy took place. And then I, the irony of ironies, the Germans bought all of Ravel and now the U S is underneath the German company, except right. for having a small, you know, it's like two person division here. And they're like, and the gentleman was like, well, yeah, I understand that, but still like, they're so much more expensive. Why can't these companies establish, you know, their own importers and not pay that markup guys. The thing to remember with these companies is they're not as big as you think they are like Salvinos. Right. If you take out the, the contract that they have with the company that molds their stuff in California and the company in China that makes their tooling. I know made in the USA, they have Chinese tooling. Yeah. They're tooling made in China. Cause that's just where tooling is done these days. Something this has five guys total and three of them really run that company. Cause the other two work in their like warehouse in their office. So it's three people. Yeah. Mobius. I don't know how many people Mobius has technically working for them at this point under Pegasus, but like at the when they were new, it was it was Maddie Winspur and it was uh, I can't remember what his name is now. The guy that was in Indiana that was their product development guy, and then you had a couple. You, know, you Mueller consulted, and you had a couple other people consulting on kits. They had two employees. Round two, like, has a bunch of employees because obviously they got Auto World and Johnny Lightning and all the diecast and Chad who does the video that everybody hates. He's technically their diecast guy. And you have Jamie Hood who does their sci fi stuff, who's the head of modeling. And then you have people like Steve who contract for him. But like the modeling department of, of round two is three people, four, right. you know? Right. So Ravel in Germany is like to me in Japan. Ravel in Germany makes tools and paint and glue and RC and drones and puzzles and, and all toys and all that sort of stuff. They're a Tamiya sized company in Europe. Right. It was it Ravel in, in the United States was never that big because they didn't make any of that stuff. That was testers. So that's a whole separate thing. That's RPM. That's you know Rostolium and all that. Right. I it, it's not physically possible for a company with two, three, five people running it to establish an office in Europe. Who's going to staff it? How are they going to afford that? Like, I I understand that that people in Europe want those kits for cheaper. I guys in Canada want those kits for cheaper, but That's um, sure. uh, yeah, you're going to unfortunately the 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 truth of the matter is you're going to deal with that middleman markup of of imported prices because there's just there's no way for them to do it. It'd be great if they could, but even Tamiya, which had that huge German division, Tamiya Europe. It was all encompassing in like the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Is where all of the Tamiya race cars came from that weren't Japanese, right? All those DTM kits, all of the 956 and 962s, all the Group C cars. That was all. If you look at the sides of those boxes, all Tamiya Europe GmbH. They had yeah. a huge division in in Germany, but 20 years later, it doesn't exist. It's gone. Tamiya Europe is a handful of say 15 people or so, or 15 people, 15 retailers in Europe that sell to me as product, but they don't have an office, not like to me a USA does where there's an actual physical building with employees out there in California. I don't know, you know, what the reasoning is behind that price wise, like is Europe too expensive to operate in, or maybe they just want like there's too many Mercedes and BMWs in this Japanese kit lineup, screw Germany, we're out, or what what, you know, there's a I'm sure there's an entire story of the history of why Revolve, you know, why to me it's Europe division 
you know, slowly went away and now it doesn't exist. But, you know, unfortunately, it's just not realistic to expect a company with three people to be like, hey, you know what we're doing? We're hiring somebody who speaks four languages to open a satellite office in Dusseldorf. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. Sorry, guys. It's just the, you know, if you look at American kit prices in Japan, they're $50, $60 because those kits have to go through either Beaver, which is the, the, the side business that HLJ runs, or they go through Platts, who imports like Italeri, Sabinos, Round 2, or they go through Hasegawa, which is still the importer for Ravel in both both Ravels in, uh, in Japan. I told you that I saw the uh, Salvino's kit at Yodobashi Camera, and it was like $90, 9,000 yen. I was like, good Lord. Well, you figure that uh, the current Salvino's kits, propped up a large, in large part by how much Cartograph's charging for decals right now, I mean, they're 60 bucks US with what the MSRP is, and... $90? Right. I mean, it's not even a 100% markup. It's only 50% markup in, in reality. Right. So, right. Yeah, model kits are expensive. Totally. No doubt about it. And um, and, and since we're two hours in already, it's, I'm not going to sit here and go into a discussion right. of like Next the time. economy of 1965 or anything like that. But I, I just thought it was interesting because, you know, I think, I think to a certain extent, we think of these companies as being these, you know, ah, it's round two. They're monolithic. It's AMT, right. they're they've been around forever. Yeah, they are, but in 2024, that is a small team of people that is, you know, still pushing my if there's a ever lot of decisions, a, yeah. I say if there's if there's ever a anything about models that fit into that category of like, oh, we're lucky they're still around, that would be one of them because these companies are really I mean, they're not making as many kits and all the rest of that stuff, but you know, they're 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 small, very lean focused operations at this point they're not right they're not the megalithic corporations they may have once been in the past even though they probably weren't that big in the past either they right. just ran their own production facilities back then but how many of the guys working on the floor in dyersville putting boxes together were in charge of making the decisions well they weren't it's still the same right. you know five ten people right well james i i had a good time tonight i hope uh the 25 people who are still online Thank you very much for sticking around. Um, grab this one. Any idea why Mobius discontinued the 61 Pontiac Ventura SD? It's just it, they sold the production run of it. You know, it's not so much they discontinued it on purpose. They just sold out of it. And again, Mobius, new ownership, speed of cash. Do they think that there's enough sales out there for 3,000 more of them? Probably, you maybe. know, maybe not. Maybe so. You know, I think the only kid i can think of that mobius has reissued is that 69 ford the one that uh, sean was that did the box art and all that stuff for that that yeah. kid has been reissued i think twice mainly because it's got the six in it and people buy that kit just for that motor okay but you know um, if, if if the demand is out there they'll reissue at some point but if they tell they sell their kits then they're gone for however long it takes to get them back right right I'm sure there's plenty out there in the market. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Billy. Yep. Thank you guys for joining us again. Like I said the next show will be April the 8th, where we may really bore the living tears out of you with Japanese model chat. <laughs> um, I don't think either one of us will have shows before then, so it'll just be, uh, we'll, we'll have to come up with, with uh, a topic du jour to uh, roll up the crowds. We'll have to figure out something. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's see you in two weeks, James. All right. Appreciate it, guys. All right. Thanks good for coming. Good night, everyone. See you guys on the other side.